uh, before we start, I just want to give a shout out to our sponsor, UCL. Uh, so we have a small promo video to play. Uh, please do bear with us. Welcome everyone uh, to Redefining Classrooms. Where to be, today we are going to be discussing about the future of education and how we can proceed to develop our education system post pandemic. So uh, until Ms. Hasna joins, uh, I'll hand over the controls to Chatushka. So he'll be your moderator this evening. Uh, Chatushka, you can take over. Great, thank you so much, Parami. So a very warm welcome to our elite and eminent panelists. It's an absolute honor and privilege to moderate a discussion on redefining classrooms and talk about uh, future opportunities in the education industry post uh, COVID-19. So before we set off with uh, the, uh, the webinar, there are a few ground rules that I wish to bring your attention. To the audience, no person will use this platform to accuse or criticize a political affiliation or ed education institute. For questions, please post questions in the comments section and it shall be read out to the panelists. If your question has been already answered during discussion, please refrain from reposting the same question again. For comments on the live stream, no profanity, no demeaning or hate comments against any education institution will be tolerated. In the event of non-cooperation, you will be removed from the live stream and may not participate for any future webinars conducted on our page. Also, violators will be reported to Facebook for, for violating their community standards. To our esteemed uh, panel, I shall be reading out the questions and giving the opportunity to each panelist to share their own perspective. A time slot of three minutes will be allocated for answering each question. We, uh, we appreciate your kind cooperation in adhering towards the timelines. So it's my, it's my privilege to introduce our distinguished panelist, uh, Ms. Anitra Pereira, Managing Director, Coordinating Principal, Alithia Group of Schools. The Reverend Mark Limuria, Warden, St. Thomas's College, Mount Slovenia. Ms. Nelum Senadira, Principal of Lucius College. 
Ms. Vinita Shanoi, Principal of Gateway College, Colombo. Mr. Malit Vikramukumar Singh, Coordinating Principal, Guchali International School, Gampa. Ms. Hazna Hezbollah Ifla, Vice Principal of Hejaz International School. Good evening to all and thank you for accepting our invitation and joining this webinar. So without uh, further ado, let's uh, dive straight into the questions. Uh, so education is uh, one industry that has been completely disrupted because of this unprecedented pandemic. And you as educators would have been compelled to leverage on digital platforms and online teaching to keep yourselves relevant. Did you have an online teaching platform in place in school prior to March 2020? Or was it a completely new scope that you had to probe into within a short time span? So Ms. Uh, Pereira, uh, from Alithia International. Alithia International has a rich history and heritage of more than 90 odd years and having a vision towards a technology driven education framework. I would first like to seek your thoughts. The floor is all yours. Thank you, Chapter. Good evening. Uh, I just want to start by saying how privileged it is to be on this panel with a set of veterans in the education industry. Uh, so uh, moving on to Chapter's question, uh, no, we didn't have an online platform, uh, active platform before the pandemic started. Uh, but in September 2019, we launched our first phase of the digital school. Uh, that's where we made all classrooms smart classrooms from the pre-grade up to advanced level. And actually, our second phase was to commence in May 2020, where we were actually going to go digital with the online teaching. So in March, when this pandemic started, we were in the process of going digital, but uh, in the process of collecting data, and you know how it works with parents, it's very hard to collect data from kids and parents. So that's where we were, and we were at a stall at that point. So from during the pandemic time, we had to speed up our process in going online, which was our target for May 2020. So I think, my simple answer would be no, but now we are. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Perea. Uh, so Reverend uh, Billy Moria, now St. Thomas's Mount is a renowned uh, pioneering educator, which has uh, created the best in the youth. Uh, it, the country went into a complete lockdown post one of the most anticipated fixtures that we all look forward to, the Royal Thomian Big Match. How seamless was the transition for St. Thomas's Mount to leverage on digital technology uh, and move away from the traditional more and big classrooms. I would like to uh, seek your thoughts. Hi, Chatushka. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me on this. Uh, well, uh, like Alithia, we also had begun to look at, um, you know, smart classrooms and things like that. And we had started putting smart classrooms into place from the end of 2018 over 2019. Uh, but nothing prepared us for what was to come uh, in March with the lockdown. I don't think any of us were, uh, were prepared for that. Um, we began with uh, study packs that were delivered to the kids over our, our school management system, the Akura management system. Uh, we had study packs you know, sent over to the, the kids and those were sent back to the teachers. But within a short space of time, uh, by the middle of April, uh, we began to experiment with an online uh, classroom using the Zoom uh, technology that's available. Uh, and by the 20th of April, we launched uh, full-scale online classes for all classes from grade six upwards. Uh, initially, they were uh, just for a few subjects, but now, uh, as of today, we have uh, online classes for all subjects from grade six all the way up to A-level. Uh, the primary school, we decided that we don't want to burden the kids with too much academic uh, workload. So we just have contact uh, classes from nursery up to grade three, but grade four and five, we have some limited academic work being done. Uh, the main goal being for grades one to three and nursery for the, the, the boys to be in touch with the teacher and just have that sort of uh, link and continue, continue the connection as it were uh, with the school. So, so far things are going okay. We've got some good feedback from parents. And I hope that at the end of this, we would have all learned something about, you know, how to do something in the midst of a crisis and come out of it uh, with, with some success. Glad to hear that. Thank you. 
Uh, Ms. Senadira, besides uh, the rich history and heritage that uh, Musius College has, it also has an enrollment of more than 6,500 students at current and has a well-qualified academic faculty of more than 300 teachers. How, was, how seamless was the conversion uh, at Musius College? Uh, hello to all and uh, also thanks uh, Chocolate Magazine for getting us on board because we can talk to people and make them understand what we have got. We went through, I, I think uh, I agree with Anita and uh, Reverend uh, Bill Moria that uh, I guess I know uh, some schools did have it in place, but we did not have any online teaching in place, but we had the LMS and a few smart boards i think at that time we would have had about 16 smart boards for about uh, almost close to 200 classes it's, it's upwards uh, it was not for the other classes because uh, we could not install to the entire school at that time then uh, suddenly we we were faced with this and uh, but but i'm thankful that we trained all the teachers with the initial training of uh, the lms and uh, a bit of online teaching. We had given uh, two introductory training programs uh, by about, I think we started in February. But, you know, as with all teachers, it's very difficult to get them to come because these are in the afternoons and, it's, and with 348 teachers, it's rather difficult. So to get everybody, even in batches, but master teachers train. We had 15 master teachers trained and we had all the IT teachers also along with them trained. So uh, on the 13th, when uh, I think it was the 12th that uh, the government announced that the school will be closed, so no, I think it was the 13th of March. So uh, then uh, we had an, uh, a meeting, an emergency meeting a staff meeting immediately after school and we got uh, we got the, our trainers to come and make the teachers understand make them you know what what really was what it's with technology is something people are scared of and uh, they're quite used to the blackboard and the white uh, the, the whiteboard and the blackboard and the markers and the chalk but anything else beyond that was like even the smart boards were well yes one thing away uh, well because because they were being shared i think it would uh, teachers were using it because it was not every day available uh, and the children were demanding and uh, then on that day on the 13th at the staff meeting we we made them understand no you got to get into online teaching you said nothing doing you have to so it was kind of, uh, we put them in the deep end. Uh, there was, uh, they, they had not learned to swim at all. They would have had learned to paddle something. But uh, some didn't even have a smartphone. But we said, no, you got to get uh, share with people at home or whatever, you got to be there. So from the, uh, from Monday, the following Monday, we started training them online. We got them uh, somehow to get, uh, you know, we, we grouped them under the master teachers and the master teachers helped them to check in and sign on, sign in and all that. It was rather difficult, but somehow we made them, made it. And uh, by the 20th, we had started doing a timetable. Uh, we started in that as well. We didn't go full scale, uh, full scale ahead. Uh, initially, we had one and a half hours with just two subjects and to help the teachers who were not very uh, proficient we grouped the classes as well so that's how we started and right now we have uh, we we have classes online classes from grade 1 to 13 even the reason uh, for the year 13 uh, year 13 says you know you should don't come to school in the third, third term and this is their third term but all the children are there for the revision classes because they they love this and they this is uh, tuition classes were a little lower at the lower end I think and we we were there right there for them and they were all there for the classes 
and even the nursery we started sending activity packs and we are uh, covering the entire school uh, through the e-learning program yes thank you for sharing that insight uh, ms senadira uh, Ms. Shanoi, you have played an integral and active role in Gateway's journey in becoming one of Sri Lanka's premier international schools. Uh, could you take us through the conversion? How seamless was it? Did you have an online platform uh, implemented prior to March 2020? I would like to hear your thoughts. First of all, I must thank uh, Mrs. Michelle Gunasekra for having invited me for this uh, panel and this talk redefining classrooms and to be with such people I'm very honored. Thank you very much. Uh, to begin with let me say that uh, from shaking hands to the Ayubhavan we are going to all make changes and changes are going to happen. We are going to learn to uh, you know cover our mouth when we sneeze, wash our hands every time we touch something. So hygiene is um, not going to be just uh, a good habit is going to become a lifestyle. The same way change is imminent. And looking at talking about, uh, talking about working on the internet and digital uh, teaching, uh, for people like me, uh, digital immigrants, it's challenging, but for the digital natives, it's something that comes very easily. For Gateway, I think it was rather smooth sailing. Uh, because uh, we have been using um, online teaching. Uh, Gateway College is um, Microsoft Showcase School, and uh, I would I, I would say that it's our chairman, Dr. Harsha Alice, who is uh, the pioneer. He's the one who is visionary, and uh, if I may sound uh, I mean, not should not sound boastful, but he's also a trailblazer. And uh, you know, when this pandemic descended upon us, he just wasted no time in uh, you know herding all of us together and getting us to plan for the uh, next term. We were already on, um, already using Microsoft Teams, and as we were sh uh, Microsoft Showcase School from 2018, we have been using uh, Teams to teach. And we have been using Teams uh, uh, for various other activities as well. So when it came to uh, when it came to teaching online, uh, our leader, our team leader, change management, Mrs. Surani Maitripala, and um, some of the other master trainers immediately to got started with the tools, teaching new tools to people. We had a lot of training uh, sessions. Basically, it was to refresh, uh, refresh uh, teachers who were, you know, who were, uh, who had were, were a bit reluctant in uh, teaching, and uh, so soon we were on using OneNote, Sway, Kahoot, Forms, augmented reality, and uh, Flipgrid uh, on Teams. So uh, the pandemic uh, really got us into teaching right from foundation to uh, the A-levels, uh, we were online. And uh, when the government declared that the schools be closed, uh, we were about to begin our mock exams. Uh, so that, that week itself, the Friday, we would begin exams. And uh, we decided that we will go on with it. Uh, we will go on with the exams. And with the help of um, uh, well, with the help of all the teachers and our good plan, uh, planning, I think it was a lot of planning and collaboration, we were able to carry on the mock exams. We were able to, in, in the time frame, I think we were one of the very few schools could actually conduct the exams as per the uh, set uh, timetable and within the time frame, we had to give the kids a bit of extra time for uploading the papers. And the exams were done, questions, uh, answer papers were marked, uh, paper discussion was done, and uh, even the marks were coded. So it was rather smooth sailing. Thank you, Mr. Noy. Uh, Mr. Kumar Singh, Vichali International School has been the first, and I believe the only comprehensive center in Gampa district providing 
uh, a Cambridge curriculum to the students. How, ha how seamless has the conversion been uh, to leverage on uh, digital uh, technology? I would like to hear your thoughts. Okay, uh, thank you, Chadushka. Uh, firstly, um, thank you for inviting me uh, for this uh, discussion. And it's a real honor and a privilege to be with uh, fellow educators on this panel. Uh, the answer to your question, um, even before uh, COVID-19 came, at which we were contemplating about having an LMS and we were already talking about uh, technology at that uh, time. And uh, unfortunately, COVID-19, you know, came as a shock to the entire world out of the blue. And uh, to be frank, we did not have a very formal uh, online teaching platform. But what we did was uh, when COVID-19 came, Chatushka, we were able to quickly conduct a meeting on March 13th. I, I was actually uh, um, supposed to go for the Royal Tongan big match. I had bought the ticket and uh, I was supposed to go to the Brumby's tent. But unfortunately, I had to forego that and go to Gampuha and conduct uh, that emergency meeting. And I basically uh, did kind of like a scenario build building. I was able to envisage how uh, the next uh, three, four month period will work out in this entire country, given the situation, kind of like a scenario building. And we conduct an emergency meeting where I told we have to quickly get ready. And I told that all the um, technological related training will be provided for them. And what we did was in the subsequent week, we were able to train our staff who were at varied levels in terms of their technical uh, and you know technological knowledge to function on the Zoom platform. I think Zoom has kind of like transformed the way we um, deliver education out there. And it's a very easy going technology. As long as you have a laptop or a tablet and a good internet connection, you are able to do the delivery and the screen sharing and so many facilities on Zoom. So uh, we were able to give an intense training in about two days and by around the March 20th, we were able to deliver education to almost all the grades through Zoom, where we had a very good uh, communication and support from the parents as well. And of course, age did have a factor. I mean, there were some teachers who were not very, uh, what you call, uh, uh, technologically savvy, uh, given their background and the age and so on. But uh, I made it a point to communicate uh, based on, you know, uh, the Darwinian theory, hmm? evolve or go extinct. It, it boils down to that. We all have to adapt to any change out there. Huh? So that is what happened at which we were able to quickly, you know, get everyone uh, to work on Zoom. And uh, I feel, you know, technology is very, very uh, useful and we can face any situation in future thanks to technology. That's my uh, take on uh, this entire transition that happened. And now classes are happening smoothly and we can even do online assignments as what uh, Ms. Vinita mentioned as well. So uh, it wasn't difficult at all and it uh, boiled down to the attitude of my staff and parents. So they were very positive, so it wasn't difficult. Thank yes. you for that. Thank you for that insight, uh, Mr. Kumar Singer. Uh, Ms. Iflal, uh, Hejas International has been known for a school that provides high quality education, high quality English medium education to students. I would like to uh, seek your thoughts in terms of uh, uh, the pandemic. Uh, was it an easy transition to move into uh, uh, adapting to digital technology? Um, actually, it was quite easy because uh, in 2018, we introduced the smart class uh, concept in our school. So the teachers had been going through this online teaching concept for about two years, starting from the beginning of 2018. And uh, we got an opportunity to do a bit of a dry run last year when schools closed. Um, we couldn't reopen after the April holidays. So even though we didn't go full scale like how we did this time, we did have a quite a good experience. We knew where we went wrong, the glitches and everything, um, because for about one and a half months, we were closed. Um, so it was uh, when it was announced on 12th of March that schools were going to be closed. Fortunately, um, about somewhere around the end of January and February, I uh, have friends who are teachers in Italy and in uh, Guangzhou in China. So just when I called them up to ask uh, about their health and how th their well-being, um, I just asked how schools were, uh, with the, since the schools were being closed, what were y'all doing and what were the applications the teachers were using? 
So uh, somewhat I was a bit prepared. Uh, I had a few discussions with uh, some of the sectional heads, uh, even though I didn't want to be Dr. Doom, you know, say that uh, we will be going into lockdown and we will also have to do these things. I had the head teachers prepared, their mindset prepared for such a thing. So when it was announced on the 12th of uh, March, schools were going to close. It was uh, not a surprise that for us that uh, we need to now start online classes. The 13th, uh, was, which was a Friday, we had a staff meeting. And over the weekend, the teachers sent out the timetables and uh, the schedules and everything. And uh, that week, 16th, we started the classes. Uh, even though it was uh, uh, not a full-on week that week, it was a uh, short schedule, but we did start. Uh, we also gave the liberty uh, for the teachers to choose some of the applications because we, we wanted them to try it out. So they used uh, things like Zoom, Skype, uh, some even um, uh, used uh, applications like Edmodo and you know different uh, uh, applications according to the age of the child and uh, the age of the teacher also mattered a bit in choosing the application. And uh, we also have the Google Classroom concept. Uh, uh, we use the Google Classroom app. We've been using it for about two years now. So it was easy for the teachers. And we also have been having teacher training practically once a month. Uh, so it was not a bit of an issue for the teachers to take it on. And since we did it before the proper curfew started, some of the teachers who were struggling were able to get help from the uh, other other ones who were managing managing it quite well. So there was a bit of a teacher teacher peer uh, learning also there. So it was not a big big issue for the teachers, and I'm happy that they all took it on and they started enjoying it so much that when I told them third of April we close school for the holidays, they didn't want to. Uh, they wanted to continue, but then we had to say no, 3rd to 22nd we are closed, so take it, take the holiday. Thank, thank you, Ms. Ifla, for that uh, wonderful insight that you shared. Uh, so I would like to move on to my uh, next question. Uh, online learning could have implications in terms of six uh, everyone might not be able to access this form of education and there could be certain concerns. As a pioneering educator, are you able to provide equal opportunities to everyone? Is there an impact for schools located in urban areas? What has the school done? Are you conducting classes on a daily basis? How are you rationing out data? I would first like to uh, hear Ms. Pereira's thoughts on that. Well, uh, I think this is a big problem that all schools face uh, when it comes to data, whether it's for the staff, the parents, the students. It's, I think, a common problem in every household. Uh, so what we did was initially, like, uh, as soon as the pandemic started, we also uh, did do study packs. So what happened is we used to send the study packs ahead uh, before the online classes started. And then with the online classes also, we, have, we are still continuing the study packs. So a part of the lesson was in the study pack and the children used to come online to clarify their doubts uh, and to see what is missing, what they do not understand in the study pack. So when it came to uh, see not every, if you take a family, there might be two or three children in the family, maybe even more than three. So then it comes to the rationing out of, okay, who gets the laptop, who gets the tab and all. So that's another problem which we face because we ha in our school we have uh, we have groups of families with children. So that's where we we actually started on Microsoft Teams is our online platform. Uh, we we actually record the lesson and what we say is for the kids uh, if you say if you can if you miss this particular time you can always come back online and view the lesson and then it's like as if you're a part of the lesson. And also our teachers are available. Uh, online throughout the day, but of course there's a cut-off time of four o'clock in the afternoon where they need to do their personal work. So if, if they do miss out and all, they come in online and the teacher works with them directly. Uh, also, it's what I would say, we also partnered with uh, certain uh, institutes, like uh, we partnered with Softlogic uh, to offer our students and staff uh, laptops and uh, 
at concessionary prices on installments uh, and also we uh, we recommend that age appropriate uh, technology equipment so we, that's one thing we did to, to help out both parents and the staff then uh, we also partnered with dialogue with through the partnership of this to offer uh, concession rates for routers for our staff uh, and then also we spoke dialogue and routers were delivered to our students during the pandemic uh, situation where they could not access this because uh, mo uh, one thing mobile data is not strong enough to go online that's one thing we faced as an issue and also we partnered with uh, south asian uh, technologies uh, for kaspersky internet uh, security software so because uh, see you are leaving your child at maybe they might just go out to get something or uh, go out to the next room but you're leaving your child online so there is a lot of threats there is a lot of uh, i say unethical things that also take place in weakness that's one thing we partnered to help out and also we what we did is we drafted a code of ethics and etiquette for both the students and the staff of how things should work online so we we actually ran through this with the staff members staff members the staff members kept training the rest of the staff and then the staff teachers trained the students so that's one thing we did and uh, i must say that uh, it through this pandemic we all realized how we could uh, i mean the staff also relied on each other uh, on to help each other so that's one thing uh, i think unity and team work increased that this during this pandemic which took sometimes takes a lot of outbound training and all to take this but then i realized during this pandemic that happened and also we uh, uh, we gave out laptops to our staff who didn't have access to laptops because uh, some of them were trying to teach through the phones and all which were not uh, were not working in the first instance then what we did is we to we uh, actually some of them we delivered laptops some of them came and collected it so these are ways we kind of helped out our staff and then the students also we uh, we kind of tried to see how we could help them through these different various partnerships uh and i would say uh, uh initially we were all a part of the first few lessons of the classroom because all the heads were in attending at some point of lesson because you know you put a bunch of kids online and then you get one of them muting the other person and the other one muting and they are sharing screen so it was like a big uh, fascination for them because they are seeing their friends after many uh, number of days weeks online and then it, it was just for them it was just not doing the lesson it was more on chit chatting and all so once in a way we had to surprise the class and say here look we are also online so that was one thing uh, the heads and my staff the core team was online doing but there are after things settled down uh, now kids know how it is they know if they miss a lesson they send a text to the Uh, teachers saying that they are not coming online so that etiquette part is very we are very firm and we are very strong on that thank you miss uh, perera in uh, certainly impressive initiatives and partnerships and collaborations have been undertaken by anitya uh, i would also like to hear the thoughts of uh, reverend ivoria on the question Raven you're on mute Raven Bidmoria you're on mute I think my experience has been the same uh, in many ways uh, I wonder how many I'm wondering whether we have uh, seen today the uh, and how it is uh, where some students are more equal than others they say the fantastic article because it raises a number of the concerns that we have been having even of, about students in our own school uh there is an assumption that because we are a private school that every child will have access to the the necessary data the necessary uh, you know the, the 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 devices or whatever and it's just not true and that's a huge concern for us uh that there are children who are not benefiting from online uh, online learning um, and this is probably the case all over the country uh there was a survey done by if i'm not mistaken uh after access Uh, an organization that did a did a survey and their findings are quite disturbing about how many homes in this country uh, don't even have a basic computer let alone the facility to uh, come online for a classroom so the equitable distribution of education is going to be a concern uh, in general but where st thomas's is concerned we did a survey of our students who were not coming online once the online class was started and when we found out how many of them were not coming online due to a device issue 
uh, with, the, with the support of our old boys, we found ways of supplying the devices. Uh, where data is concerned, there's very little we can do. Uh, private and international schools are not, uh, you know, we don't benefit from free data like the government schools do. And this is something which Dr. Harshalas and I have been trying to uh, bring up together at, at different fora. Uh, trying to see how we can access that free data accessibility that some of our government uh, school, uh, schools have. Um, so that's an issue that we need to deal with. Uh, we can't be providing data to our kids. And the problem of data in homes where there are two or three kids, as, as uh, Anitra rightly said, is, is very much an issue. And that's something we are concerned about. Uh, the, the teachers who don't have laptops and basic devices have been supplied with those devices by the school. Uh, we've shared the school's official data with the teachers as much as we can, uh, but that uh, the fact that the teachers have to use their own home data is a problem, especially if they have kids going to other schools who also need to access uh, for their own uh, families. So those are practical problems, um, and, and those are problems which we'll have to face uh, together as we go forward. Uh, so the, the accessibility is a big issue, and wherever we find the child not able to access the class, we find ways to provide that uh, accessibility. Uh, and wherever a teacher needs a, a resource, we try to help the teacher out. So that's, uh, that's where we are. I mean, we are using Google Classrooms with Zoom. And uh, uh, we have gone completely onto the Google platform uh, for, our, for our online uh, classrooms. Uh, this gives a much better picture for us in terms of being able to see much more uh, in the classroom than uh, some of the other platforms have done for us. Uh, but accessibility that that free free accessibility for everyone is a huge concern and i'm sure it's not it's not just for us perhaps as you go around the country you will find it more acute in some places more than others thank you uh, reverend for sharing that insight i would now like to request miss sena Dira to share her views uh, yes. as well uh, yeah thank you and uh, i i think looks at it looks as if all the schools are facing the same sort of practical problems, you know, sharing computers at home, laptops, the devices, because uh, the parents, the parents were working from home, so they also needed the computers. Uh, so we had a lot of issues like that. But then uh, uh, the teachers also, because the teachers, uh, the teachers' daughters were in the school, and they were well. If she had two daughters, then that means. The two daughters were also in the classes and she also was teaching. So we had a lot of issues like that. So we started sorting out. Uh, first and foremost, we needed to make them understand that norm, what was normal prior to March 13, which was class, just basic classroom teaching, was going to change. And, and the normal now was totally different. And that it is that normal now is the online online teaching that could happen so which which they did understand but uh, it was a little difficult for them to get the hang of it and so what we did was with the assistance of our master teachers we put the teachers in teams and anyway we were on teams we were, we were doing microsoft uh, teams and uh, we were doing microsoft teams and uh, we we uh, put them uh, we grouped the classes because we, with, the, with the Microsoft Teams, we could, because we have 12 parallel classes. It was difficult to have a timetable because not all the teachers had the computers and the, the equipment. So to balance that, we put three teachers together and three classes. So the, the other two teachers were helping with the making of the presentations and getting the stuff together. And they were sharing the platform as well, teaching. So if one, one device failed, and other was able to take it over. And uh, it was like uh, kind of uh, interesting to watch as well. So I basically, every morning, I sit at 7.30 and go from grade 1 upward to grade 13 across board. So I enter all the classes and see what, what's going on. And we uh, take each, uh, each uh, point and discuss in the afternoon with the trainers. And we had constant, uh, repeatedly we had training because we had to have training to get the teachers on, on line, in line with the, all this because they lacked a lot, lacked confidence at the beginning because they did not know the technology. They were scared of technology, I think. 
basically they would have known how to switch on a tv and that's all tam again so uh, uh sorry and uh, the school the the, the grouped the, the classes when they were grouped earlier we thought we would have a problem just like anitra said we too had the issue of the take switching off removing the teacher from the class and all that so all these we have we could discuss because because we entered the classes we could address the children it was like having a short uh, a small wall scale assembly <coughs> sorry and uh, children mellowed down yes they did understand the importance of uh, being a little more you know focused on the lesson and in the afternoon the uh, the trainers to cover problems and in the evening late in the evening sometimes the meetings are going on till midnight as well they trained kept on training the teachers and they were they were also working along with us and uh, they went in taught the teachers how to take control of the team and uh, so, saw to it that no one can bother the you know disturb so that that was very very useful for us because with about 100 kids on the in a class it is rather difficult <coughs> so constant monitoring is also important because uh, uh, that's the only way that we could keep tabs on we can't go around the school like we used to do so we could we this is how we used to do enter enter the class and then see how it's going on and what i have noticed is what was for the teachers who were teaching before i mean the excellent teachers the good teachers compared to pre march and now they have come a huge long long way they have improved they have gained a lot of confidence and they have they have got the technology and they are now making presentations i mean even though the smart boards are there they were not making use of it like that but now the the way they are using the the internet and using the videos and all the other other programs that are accessible and making their uh, enriching they are now saying even if the school is open don't open too soon we need to be with the children we can be with the children parents won't send them to school early you remember last year what happened after the bombs the children we started with eight children took a long time for the children to come back but let us go with the online teaching nothing is going to be missed which i think the parents are also from their feedback the the, the parents are also agreeing and they are also uh, agreeing that we should go on with the online teaching and uh, surprisingly the present rate for uh, students who will be doing the a level exam next year the local curriculum students they have already they are already telling us uh, next because you see third term they never come to school but now they say next year third term we need you online to be doing a revision classes so they are planning even for 2021 so i think we are we the 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 norm has changed and changed to a positive very very uh, a positive platform and uh, i think every uh, what i notice in the teachers who were screaming and saying no we can't do it i we can't i can't i can't in, in fact one teacher tendered her resignation as well uh, she is the one who called me first on, on the first day and said thank you very much for pushing me into doing this i know i can do it now so uh, all the teachers are now very confident and they are the very ones who are saying we can do it and uh, uh, we will continue to do it so i think online teaching will be uh, with our topic redefining the classroom i think it's going to be a big point big uh, it has come to stay so much so our uh, management has also been watching the classes and uh, they have now told us that they will be provide the uh, smart boards for all the classes we're talking about uh, 220 classes so they are ready to provide for all um, well pretty soon
and uh, I'm pretty sure. And and the children are demanding. They are just saying we want it in the classroom itself. So I think we will we will continue. And 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 it's a positive thing. It's a positive thing. And uh, the children also, as Anitra also said, uh, they have also now realized how the, the little etiquette, you know, the decency, how to behave in the in the in, they are they are not actually seen actually. See, not seen, but we know they are what they are doing. Of of course, we we monitor, we can see what they are doing. So uh, they know how to behave in uh, behind scenes. I would say. So I think we are in the right platform. Thank you, Ms. Senadira, for that uh, feedback and response. Ms. Shanoi, I would like to hear your perspective on the question as well. Uh, I would like to say that. Uh, Fortunately, it was um, not the pandemic that kick-started the online teaching. Otherwise, I think more people would have died of heart attacks and hypertension than um, the virus. Um, so, uh, yeah, because if it was very sudden, I'm sure people would have been, uh, you know, not able to take it on. You know, the stress levels would have been very high because teaching kids, teaching students uh, who are the digital natives is... Uh, is rather challenging. So when it came to teaching online, uh, Dr. Alice, uh, chairman and the board of directors, they were very keen on the safety of the staff as well as the students. There were many people who wanted to come to school and still conduct a few classes. There were teachers who were having problems, uh, digital problems, uh, data problems and wanted to come and do, you know, conduct it from school. Uh, but uh, no, we did not allow anyone. Instead, uh, what we did was we provided data uh, and uh, connections. In fact, we tied up with Dialog, SLT, Mobitel, and they offered very attractive packages, both for our teachers as well as our students, so that the uh, data packages increased and teaching could happen even while they were at home. Uh, for the devices also, we tied up with the uh, Hewitt, Packard and they have given computers and lap, uh, sorry laptops and printers at very reasonable rates. Uh, initially, when teachers were finding it difficult, we had uh, a lot of tabs in school which we were otherwise using for lessons. Uh, they were sent home uh, to individual teachers whenever they asked, uh, so that they could be better equipped in case they did not have any devices working uh, devices at home. So we did provide the connectivity, we did provide the devices for everybody so that they could manage with the online teaching. Now we were teaching right from foundation to the A-level classes, all were doing online classes. Uh, the foundation and the key stage one were on Google Teams and on Class Dojo. And the bigger classes were on Microsoft Teams. And I must tell you here, Every child from year three upwards was provided a free of cost Microsoft account. So that's why they all had the accounts and all that they had to do was log on and uh, you know get themselves connected and do. So that was, that was something which was planned very well by the management uh, because uh, there were so many, and sometimes there were children of different classes, different grades and classes had to be done. We staggered the timing. You stagger the timings of the classes so that different classes were being conducted at different timing, starting with the three, four, five, six, which were early in the morning, and then the younger ones. And the, the foundation, uh, the smaller ones, we start, we put the classes at five o'clock because we realized that parents would need to be there to be with the kids <clears throat> to put on and to provide, uh, to provide the assistance for the lessons. And obviously, if the parents were not there at home, they wouldn't have been able to do the lessons. So those lessons were put at five o'clock in the evening. Of course, they were very short, short intervals. Uh, lessons were very short duration, but we put it at that time. And then we had a sports program for the kids because uh, Gateway being, um, you know, very, very active in sports. And a lot of our students are <clears throat> represent, even at representing the country. So sports, different sports was being... Uh, you know, taking a real solid hitting. And uh, again, that's how our chairman came up with this plan. And we had the, uh, uh, you know, online lessons, uh, sports lessons for the kids. Every evening we have that from 5.30 to 6.30. So we tried to do everything what 
uh, well, I can't see everything, but we tried to do as much as possible so that every level of student was able to do some kind of work. Uh, we didn't want anyone to be left behind. We didn't want anyone, any, uh, we even did our clubs and societies online. Uh, we organized our meetings and they chose their <coughs> board members. So all that was done online so that, uh, you know, the students could do what they also, even our drama club um, uh, conducted their own meetings and their own little dramas. Um, for that, uh, for that, uh, you know, when I just heard about uh, Reverend Ma talking about the inequitable, inequitable uh, distribution of education in all the, yes, it's, it's something which is, uh, you know, something that needs to be taken care of. Probably in our schools, it uh, may not uh, happen to a large extent. I won't say 100% are online, but I would say at least 90, 95% are there online. But yes, what happens to those students who are not getting uh, access to, uh, you know, digital uh, learning? And I hope at some time we could do, I know some of our students do community service and they have been providing books and they have uh, redone a library, they have redone a science lab in some very remote uh, village. And I know they have also been providing the laptops which were lying ex in excess, but I hope we would be able to do something more for these kids because I think uh, children of every, of every age, of every income, of every status should not be left behind. Education is something which is uh, necessary for every child. And uh, hopefully it may not be only just book education, but any kind of education so that children are not just left behind. So, yes, that's... that's Thank you, Mr. Education. Uh, Mr. Kumar Singh, I would like to hear your views as well. I think the majority of my sentiments were already had by Ms. Anitra and uh, Reverend Mark Vilimoria. So I'm going to keep it very brief uh, now that they've been already covered. I think uh, like what they mentioned, you know, there were many challenges. I think even things like uh, power cuts got in the way. I think last evening I encountered a teacher who was telling me in the Hadworth area that there was a power cut and that uh, she's going to struggle to do the Zoom class. So uh, date had been a challenge. Uh, the availability of laptops and other devices at home. Uh, I mean, Sri Lanka isn't like a very, uh, what you call rich, affluent country where every family member is having a laptop per person. Uh, usually it'll be a, uh, like a shared scenario. Uh, but what I was able to do, Chatushka, I mean, at Bichali, where I think we really uh, pulled it off, I'll put it that way, is the fact that we have created a very uh, bonded family-like culture where each stakeholder is willing to help out each other. I think in a pandemic situation of this nature, there is a very strong chance that people might end up becoming a bit selfish and, you know, a bit cold, you know, like every man for himself kind of like a scenario. There's a possibility of that happening. So I uh, thought like, you know, we should lead the way in um, salvaging humanity. So, at Bichali, what we did was during the uh, last one month period, whenever we had Vesak and, you know, uh, New Year and all that, we ensured that, you know, kids did a online uh, kind of like a Bhakti Ghi. Uh, we had a Vesak competition going on online so that, you know, kids were very, you know, in line with the culture and the sharing thoughts were uh, there. And also I made it a point that we need to help out each other. So every teacher and every child, helped out each other. There were situations where the odd child or teacher couldn't come online on a particular day, but we made it a point that everyone had to share and, you know, teach. End of the day, you know, it's all about uh, kids being uh, updated on time. So I didn't uh, go on like a very uh, strong regime by telling if a teacher uh, missed, you know, the 10 a.m. session, you'll be penalized. Much rather, I told, okay, miss, if you have a problem at the 10 a.m. session, you know, come at 4 p.m., get the lesson covered. If there was a child without data, we have already created a culture where, you know, there'll be uh, kind of like peer uh, teaching happening too. You know, uh, Amal would, you know, teach Kamal somehow by the end of the day. So I think it's very important that you create a very good uh, culture where we are like one family and we are willing to help out each other. And I would also like to uh, touch on something that Miss Vinita already mentioned. And I think as uh, educators, we are willing to help uh, any underprivileged group in the country who are struggling. We also have uh, what you call the TISAL, the International Schools of Sri Lanka, 
के वेयर द टॉप ट्वेंटी फोर प्रीमियर इंटरनेशनल स्कूल लाइक इन इन अ फैमिली एंड वी आर विलिंग टू हेल्प ऑल्सो चतुष्क इफ यू कम अक्रॉस एनी पार्टी हु इज पोटेंशियली स्ट्रगलिंग Uh, with you know this kind of situation, I think Miss Vinita, Miss Anitra, all of us will join our hands to help out any group of that nature. Now, what I would like to mention, Chatushka, is that at Vichali we have had a culture of being very firm and kind. Uh, firmness is there to ensure that you know, like what Miss uh, Senadiri mentioned, teachers have to get their work quota covered before the end of the day somehow. without giving an excuses and also there's a very human side to it like if there's a genuine problem they were able to inform us and we did our level best because i think like what reverend mark mentioned no amount of data would be sufficient if there's a large family i mean you will have dad working on the office matters maybe the mom uh, cooking and watching online cookery video the kids on netflix a uh, few kids who are doing o level a level doing the academic work so you know we are talking of you know maybe 10 gb for a day possibly uh, with that kind of scenario so i think um, no one no one school can provide adequate data for a family that would be impractical but having said that if you create a culture where everyone is willing to help out each other uh, timely academic delivery Uh, was you know not a challenge at all, and that's what happened at Vichelli. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kumar Singh, for sharing your uh, feedback. Uh, indeed, it's practical. It's a practical perspective, also from a humanitarian perspective. I would like to uh, compliment you on that, uh, Ms. Iflal. If I could hear your perspective too on the question. Um, most of what uh, we faced with regard to data and devices have already been discussed. So. Um, something that i saw which uh, was not a not an issue it was an issue the devices and data were an issue during lockdown but what we've seen now is with parents going out to work both parents going out to work uh, there's going to be a bigger issue we've already faced that just uh, in the past week where the parents have to take their phones to work parents are not there at home to monitor the child the child doesn't have the tabs uh, the passwords and you know so because of that there's going to be a, a bigger issue continuing to teach online uh, during the lockdown are not going to be there so um, for that even during the lockdown especially when we had families uh, where there were three children and sometimes the mother was also a teacher and all that we were flexible with the time and also we recorded all of almost all of the lessons and um, sent it to anyone who wanted it so that they uh, we we've, we've seen parents downloading those uh, recorded videos after 12 midnight or early morning before the peak hour started so that way it was uh, managed up to a certain extent because Uh, we we have this policy no child left behind policy so it was very important that everybody got an equal opportunity opportunity i mean even if they could not participate in the lesson at that time they were sent recorded uh, videos uh, and also there were a few instances when parents had requested uh, for further explanation teachers have come uh, i mean they've just done some casual uh, whatsapp video calls to the parents and spoken to the children and helped the child to uh, uh, clarify all the doubts that the child had and we also had um, like uh, mr kumar singh had told we had aurudu um, vesak and ramadan art and craft we did art and craft and pt also during our lessons where the teachers had to do games and um, uh art teach the children art and craft so it was because it was not going to be all lesson lesson which is going to be very very boring for the child so parents were very thankful because uh, after the lessons the children were occupied doing the art craft and you know continuing with uh, because they had to take pictures and send it to us which we were uploading onto our facebook page so they like to see themselves there so it was uh, we tried to make it as normal as possible um so but definitely we need to do something about the devices and data in the future because uh, if it is if this thing is going to continue 
Thank you, Ms. Uh, Isla, for sharing that uh, feedback. Uh, I would like to quickly move on to the next question. Um, security and safety has been uh, a talk uh, in terms of uh, in terms of online education. What guidelines have been taken and issued? What are the safety precautions that have been taken in terms of uh, cyber security as well as the concerns uh, and the health implications because of heightened usage of screen time? Uh, if, we, uh, if I could have uh, Ms. Pereira uh, with the opening remarks on this question. Yes, yeah, that's actually one of the key issues we all face now. Uh, at Alitia, we are very concerned about the screen timing. So what we do is we try to have very short sessions where we work with the study pack. So uh, our session starts with 30 minutes upwards from the primary grades. And what we do is we don't have more than two sessions for the primary per day. So that's the academic work, we have two sessions. And then in the afternoon, we have one 30 minute session for the let loose the energy, be it dancing, be it singing, be it uh, PT, or uh, listening to something where they can just go crazy and let loose the energy before they go back to bed in the night. So that's one thing we do. And like I said, we partnered with South Asian Technologies Kaspersky where for the online security. So a lot of the parents have gone, purchased that software at a, at a reasonable price and which they're very happy with it. So they even when the child goes online, the parent gets an alert. A parent knows how long the child is online. All this could be controlled with their smartphone. So this makes uh, their, the parents' life was easy. And also, as we increase the uh, in grades, we increase the time slot. But what we do is we have quite a lot of breaks in between. So we have a morning session, then we have an afternoon session, uh, or we have an afternoon and an evening session. So this makes the uh, rotation amongst even in the household. Uh, if they have to share a laptop or something like this, it makes it easy for per family. And uh, this uh, so, so far with Microsoft Teams, which is what we are using, uh, we have not, I don't think there are any issues globally that has happened like Zoom and all with, uh, with the hacking. So I'm happy to say with Microsoft Teams, but we are using the, uh, so far Alicia has not faced anything. And so far I don't think any school in Sri Lanka that is using Microsoft Teams as space. So that would be my this take on the online security and all and how we have managed. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Pereira. I would like to seek uh, Reverend Bill, uh, Billy Burry's thoughts as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, we've been looking at uh, cybersecurity issues long before the need for online classes started uh, because uh, of all this cyber bullying and all that that was taking place and that became quite a problem over the last two years. Um, and one of the things that we realized when we went into online classes is that we need to uh, reinforce the protocols that we had in place for cybersecurity uh, uh, outside of the online class system. So we put, put out a set of guidelines in all three languages for parents on uh, a, a set of guidelines that included not just cybersecurity, but also health and safety where usage of, uh, of, of online technology is concerned, uh, even in terms of having a break from staring at a screen, you know? So our classes, uh, we tend to have a 20 minute break between uh, the classes to give the children a bit of a break to their eyes, for their eyes. Uh, we are very conscious of the body of research out there that talks a lot about the negative impact on the younger kids. Uh, with online uh, usage uh, and therefore our grades one to five, we have limited the online classes because of that very uh, reason. We've, we've got um, some of our old boys who are doing research into this and who have given us necessary advice on how, how this can actually have an impact on the Will, uh, into the picture when we when we provided for health and safety online we've been very conscious that the young young youngsters especially the teenagers when they when they go online that there could be other issues that can happen uh, there are dangers on uh, in being online and uh, we've advised the parents to monitor their children's online usage even when they're having classes so that we are confident that uh, the children are safe uh, of course, uh, what happens at home uh, at times when they're not on the classroom itself is something that we can't control. But we've tried our best to, to, to advise and to guide uh, in the best way possible. 
Thank you, uh, Reverend uh, Plimoria. Uh, Ms. Senadir, I would like uh, if you could share your thoughts as yeah, well. Uh, uh, well, we, we, we do understand that, uh, well, with Teams, we have had no, no issues uh, at all with, with the Microsoft Teams uh, about uh, hacking or whatever, you know, uh, unlike uh, I heard that Zoom does have a, a few uh, internet issues. We have not had any of those. But uh, when it comes to the uh, screen time and, uh, you know, uh, getting the children to be left on the internet for too long, uh, we have, uh, for the last two or three years, we have been uh, having sessions with children, with the students. Uh, we have brought in uh, speakers from outside. We have talked to them. We have talked to them about the dangers of it about uh, being safe on the internet. Uh, we do need the internet, but you have to be safe on the internet and how, what to do and how to, how to protect them. Uh, most of the parents' meetings we have, or the, the adults also, we uh, talk to the parents, uh, not only talk, we uh, get the outsiders to come and advise them, specialists, on the area to come and talk to them. So the parents and the students are aware. But yes, we have been, in the past, we have been saying, clearly the parents don't let the children be on the, on the internet too long. But now we are telling them, yes, they have to be. But yes, parents and the students, both parties, I know it's amusing, but uh, there, is no, there is no other way out. So we got to use it and use it so I think we are in the loop. We we have had and uh, with the with the team with the Microsoft Teams, uh, we we can when when the teacher finishes the lesson and uh, we, the the teacher has full control of the lesson and she can. Uh, we use in the excuse of the teams uh, to you know get uh, invite other people into the group and do things that would be not quite right. So we have not had any issues. Yes, uh, being on in the in, uh, looking at the screen for a long time is a problem, but uh, we do give them a short break and you know these are things uh, we we in, we in, we have included other little. Uh, things like uh, you know listening to music, listening to poetry, uh, aesthetic appreciation, uh, literary appreciation, and things like that into the programs. So for dabbing at the thing and the teachers give them little activities to sign up and do things uh, you know accordingly according to the their session. So uh, going. Uh, doing introducing those things have most certainly helped them to break away you know looking out off the screen for some time and getting back yes thank you miss senadira uh, mr noy i would like to hear your perspective as well um yes um the uh, i would say that um, the screen time or uh, usage of a lot, spending a lot of time on computers did not really start with the COVID uh, because we did see a lot of students on playing computer games for hours on end. We did find uh, children being, uh, you know, glued to the computer, especially when parents were, when they were unsupervised. So it was there, COVID just heightened it, made it, you know, emphasized it much more made it uh, more because people were locked down at home and uh, the computer was their main source of recreation. Uh, people have got so used to use the digital technology as a source of recreation. And uh, so, you know, more and more people were using uh, the screen time. We also used where, where we otherwise use classrooms. Now we were using it on screen. But as I said, the foundation and certainly the smaller classes, we had very short class uh, screen time and a lot of activities. There was a the break between the classes so that the children 
could have uh, a break. And yes, we know through research that uh, a lot of a long time on screen is not good. It's bad for the eyes. It's bad for the brain. And a lot of uh, you know negative feedback is there. But then what to do? Technology is there, and it needs, and we need to find solutions for that. And as uh, Reverend Mark said, uh, yes, we also have been having experts coming and talking to students before this about cybersecurity. We've had lots of, we have a lot of soft skills on a regular basis uh, where we call people from out. We had the Akra yes, uh, recently who came and spoke on uh, sex education. We have on cybersecurity. We have a lot of uh, programs for the children, telling them, keeping them, making them aware of the negative uh, implications of uh, the internet, but at the same time, technology is there to stay. And as, as, as we all know that the world is changing so fast, we can't be left behind. And as it says, when the wind of change blows, some build walls, some build windmills. So we have to look as educators and what kind of windmills that we will build or create for our students. We have to take it on. We have to move on with times. But yes, how will we do it in the best possible manner? Uh, Hopefully we can, hopefully time will tell trial and it's a trial and error. It's not a situation any of us have been in or through before, um, but uh, time, it will pass and we will be able to overcome it. And uh, I think we human beings have such strong resilience uh, that, uh, you know, it doesn't, it just, it's a matter of time where we think of, uh, you know, ways and means of overcoming it. And now that we have so many educators, we are on a panel like this, we talk together with other people. And challenges, are, what is my challenge I could hear was what uh, Reverend Mark said, and uh, Malit said, Mr. Senadir, everybody has the challenges are you know, similar. So we will have to find windmills that will uh, change and bring uh, benefits, see the benefits of technology rather than it drowning us into a whirlpool of uh, misery. Thank you, Mr. Noy, for enlightening us. Uh, Mr. Kumar Singh, anything that you could further add to the question? Okay, from my end, what I feel is, Chatushka, I think uh, on-screen time uh, started going up way before uh, COVID, like what Ms. Vineta mentioned. I think from the day televisions came into the country, I think on-screen time has been going up, to be frank. Uh, so it's nothing new. It's just that now you have uh, more, you know, things like tablets, laptops, all these devices on top of the traditional TV. So naturally, the younger crowd will go with what's in the trend. So that I feel we cannot immediately curb down. There are enough and more articles and publications about the damage on screen time would do to neural development, to their eyesight, and, you know, even their social skills and so on. Having said that, no one has given, uh, you know, like a one box solution. I think like what Ms. Ms. Vinita mentioned, we all need to work together on what we can do about this, but immediately nothing can be done. But what I can tell you is Chatushka, uh, we as educators, I mean, if kids are going to go online and be in front of a screen anyway, why not we educators move into the platform that these children are enjoying and ensure that whatever the time that they're spending on screen, is done for academic reasons and or for any other good reason. That's better than them, you know, uh, what you call getting involved with something unwanted on screen. So I think that's where we can actually, you know, all, uh, you know, work together and try to come up with uh, good academic things where at least the on uh, screen time will be worthwhile. And parents will be aware that, you know, when my child is on in front of a screen, they're doing something academic or something to improve their humanity. I think uh, that's the way forward. But of course, I do agree. We all need to come up with a solution uh, very soon. This will have many uh, negative, uh, what you call socio, health wise, you know, many negative impacts coming as a result of this, uh, you know, on screen time. I mean, I now have come across children who are struggling to talk uh, with their own relatives face to face. Uh, I mean, they've been, you know, uh, playing Xbox inside their room and not coming out when the uncles and aunts come. And the first thing that they ask when we are going on a trip to a bungalow even, you know, is there like a screen where I can connect my uh, PS4 and so on. So that we cannot avoid. And... Uh, 
moving to the other point of cyber safety, I think um, that just like what Ms. Vinita and Reverend mentioned, we have been doing programs, educating all the stakeholders. I think Sri Lanka lacks adequate knowledge about the dangers of the cyber world. This is where I think uh, maybe the government, at government level, maybe there needs to be more proactive involvement in educating uh, the masses about the dangers of the cyber world. Of course, we have been doing it internally, but I would say if it's done in a uh, much more formal and a more regular manner, there will be a better impact. Luckily, uh, at Vichali, we did not have a, uh, what you call, a bit of a meltdown or a downfall during the Zoom hacking, luckily. Uh, but it could happen in future. So I think it's very important that we always gear up and not to be complacent about these things and to con continuously update our knowledge on cyber safety and so on. Uh, so that's my take on uh, that particular point, Chadushka. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kumar Singh, for sharing your uh, stand on it. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ifla, if you could uh, add something to it as well. Ms. Ifla, you're on mute. I think technology is here to stay. Uh, so as schools, we cannot shun. Uh, and I think when you look at all the schools that are represented here, everyone is having the smart classroom concept where it's again screen time uh, for the children uh, in school. Um, so what we've done is even prior to COVID, we've done a whole lot of workshops on uh, using your screen time in a quality way. And um, I think uh, even your magazine came and did a few workshops for us on cybersecurity and safety in the internet uh, when you're using the internet. So we've been emphasizing uh, on that and we've been asking the students to use their uh, time on screen in a quality way. And uh, we've also advised the parents because they are the ones, because there's so much that the school could do in this situation because we are not... Uh, watching the children using those devices, it's the parents. So we would advise the parents to monitor the amount of time that the pa the children are um, on screen. And also we've given gaps in our lessons and we've given activities where they will have to uh, get out of their devices and uh, do it so that there is a bit of a relaxation in between. So that way and security uh, wise we've not had any issues up to now but it's not that we are not going to have uh, we would but it's something that we all have to deal with uh, when it comes thank you uh, Ms. Sitla, for sharing your feedback and response i would like to move on to the next question uh, uh, it's something that we've been talking about uh, which is building a knowledge-based uh, economy and education actually plays an instrumental role in that what plans do you foresee to reform our local education system? Currently, we are pretty much hell-bent on examinations where a student would necessarily memorize and reproduce it in examinations. How do we move, how do we shift, how do we pivot towards skill-oriented examinations to acquire skills such as creativity, critical thinking, uh, problem-solving skills, uh, decision-making skills, uh, giving reference to uh, certain countries such as Finland, where they have an education system where, uh, where students come in, um, they start school quite late, there is no homework, uh, and um, I mean they focus more on skill-based, skill-based learning, and similarly you have, you have Singapore as well, which is much more fast-paced, uh, but they've actually made it to the top. Uh, how do you, how do you, uh, how what is the role in terms of reforming the education system in Sri Lanka? Uh, what is the perspective that uh, the, panel, the panel could share? I would like to start with Ms. Pereira. Uh, Chatushka, that's actually something which we are lacking in the education system in Sri Lanka. But uh, I would like to say if we have some sort of uh, uh, similarity that is taking place with the changing curriculum in the London syllabus. Uh, so through uh, schools that offer the lecture syllabus and the Cambridge syllabus, uh, there is uh, this practicality, uh, this thing using vocational, uh, this thing uh, through the BTEC qualifications and all. But however, in Aritya, we do have uh, two schools. One is uh, the international curriculum, which we offer, which we offer both curriculums of Edexcel and Cambridge, and also the national school, which is like St. Thomas's, where a government-registered private school offering English, in, offering. English medium education. 
So when you look at comparing both syllabuses, there is a big difference in that. Uh, the government syllabus doesn't cater to that. It's more on the, I would say, the traditional old-fashioned theory-based knowledge. I mean, even if you take the old local old level single paper, it's five and a half hours long. Uh, which kid can sit so long for an exam like that? So there are practical issues involved. I think, uh, I hope the, uh, the uh, Ministry of Education can look into that of revamping syllabuses that way. Uh, I mean, that's my perspective. I don't know. I, I would like to hear what the rest of the panel thinks. But in the London syllabus, we are getting there. But it's only that we are stuck because still parents on that traditional uh, stereotypical, okay, okay, they need to do, do, do the book. They need to study the 100 pages, even though we say, no, we could do it in a practical approach and all. That, that, that barrier is still there in the education sector. But it, it's reducing. But it's not at a space that we would like it to reduce, but there is hope in the future of the London syllabus. So that's what I speak for. So I would like to hear what the other uh, schools like uh, St. Thomas would say, what Reverend Mark would say, and Mrs. Senadira being in the education and gate, how they tackle it. So that's my perspective. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Reverend uh, Bilmoria, we would like to hear your thoughts as well. This is a subject, uh, Chatushka, that uh, requires another forum in itself. Uh, it's also a subject about which, uh, you, you know, some people you press a button and you get them going, uh, this is my button, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, I mean, uh, I fully agree, uh, the Sri Lankan local education system is... Uh, it's not just old-fashioned, it's pretty flawed in its, uh, in its uh, way of doing things. It caters to a time when you just wanted kids to be pushed out into the, uh, into the workforce, equipped with basic things to get them into some sort of a job. Uh, uh, there is, you know, it's a heavily standardized system. The syllabus is standardized, the teaching methodology is standardized, the examination system is standardized. There is absolutely no room for individuality. There is no room for creativity or critical thinking or innovation, or as you said, even decision making. And you know, I, I made a note, uh, problem solving. Those are not things that our, our local education system actually provides for. But one thing which COVID has done, and, and, and uh, this is something we need to be very happy about, is that very soon after the, the lockdown started, uh, His Excellency the President formed a task force to look into continuing education in Sri Lanka without an interruption. Uh, Dr. Harsha Alas and I are on that task force. And one of the, the best things that have come out of this, and that's why every cloud has a silver lining, very, very soon into our discussions as a task force, one of the things that came up was what do we do beyond COVID? Are we going to do things the way we did it before? Or have we been challenged to now look at something which can be completely transformed as we go forward? And uh, the task force was able to look at this subject and a special committee of, uh, 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 was appointed uh, uh, to, to look at redesigning general education uh, across all the different education sectors for the future. And the mandate given was look outside the box, think outside the box, modernize education, look at education 4.0 uh, as, as the way forward, you know, look at things that have not been looked at before uh, because we just cannot do business as usual after we go back to things uh, or come back to things as, as normally as we can. The new normal, I mean, these all cliches, but as we go forward, it cannot be the same as before because then we would have learned nothing. So, Hopefully, with those, with the reforms that are going to be proposed by the core group on general education, if the policymakers accept those reforms, we can see a great change in the general education life of uh, Sri Lanka's education system. Not only, not only general education, not only school education, but it's being looked at right across the board, uh, from preschool up to university, to have a complete re-look at how we are delivering education. It cannot be just that old, old school of thought where you 
get children to be in a classroom following the same stuff, regurgitating what they have memorized. <laughs> so you see what I meant when I said you pressed a button. This is something I'm very passionate about. We have to change. If we don't change and we go back to what we were before, then we have learned nothing. And these last two months have been utterly... Thank you, uh, Reverend Bill Murray, for sharing your honest uh, perspective and feedback. I would like to uh, request Ms. Senadira to share her uh, feedback as well. Yeah, I'll take uh, uh, Reverend's uh, final words, like uh, what he talked about change. Uh, yes, over the years, there has been change in the local curriculum, but mostly what has happened, because we are also a school that has the local curriculum as well as the British curriculum. So, uh, and the majority is of the students are in the local curriculum. And what I have seen across board, it's, uh, yes, there has been change, but it's always an addition to the existing curriculum. It's never been removed. You know, it's been added so much so that in the grade uh, grade nine, uh, sorry, six, seven, eight classes have 19 subjects. 19, it has come to 19 subjects. They call it basket subjects, group subjects, whatever. I mean, how can students handle all this? And everyone adds on something, never takes off something. So what we need is change, yes. And... Uh, and I hope the task force will do something about le listening things. Yes, we need the knowledge, but it has to be practical. And uh, what uh, what we do when we talk about, uh, I think part of uh, Chatuska's question was how do, how do the skills come in and all. What we do is we do have a lot of societies. Uh, we Those societies are now uh, the new, newer ones we have we have about 60 societies to take, cater to the students. And the newer ones, uh, the others are dying at a natural death, I would say. But the newer ones are all innovative things. They are things like uh, we have uh, young inventors, uh, clubs, and where children have even gone abroad with their with their uh, inventions and won gold medals when they went, uh, went out of the country. And uh, I mean, it, it has, they have done so well and uh, and uh, even even in, because ours is a girls only school so it's uh, uh, we have the fashion designing you know skills where they can the fashion world is open and uh, there's a lot of demand for it so yes we get we have these societies uh, various societies that uh, certainly add on to these skills and uh, I think uh, uh, we need to add some more of those practical things uh, when we come to uh, when we come to the. Uh, I'm sure we have more ladies than gents on the panel. I think when they would agree with what I say. I mean, when we were younger, we we had we knew how to operate a machine or do something, do a bit of sewing or. How many of these girls would be doing a cross stitch uh, or a little bit of things during this time when they are doing nothing? Very few because they don't know even how to thread the needle. So you know, even little things like those, we we have started looking into. So yes, uh, we need change, and we need to see that the skills that are needed for their future lives are introduced again uh, instead of just those stereotyped uh, things. Keep being kept added on. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Ms. Shanoi, if I could uh, hear your perspective as well. Uh, we've often heard of the phrase education is not filling a pail but lighting a fire. And uh, yes, as uh, Mrs. Senadira just said, it's not about adding and adding more and more. We have to be able to do what is most apt and change with the times. Um, the 21st century skills of collaboration, communication, creativity is something which we are doing at the moment, but I think there's always room to do more and more of it. Uh, we, we, in fact, uh, recently, not only did we uh, do our um, online mocks and stuff, we also conducted a virtual Aurudu and a virtual Vesak. I'm not sure whether you all knew it was on the TV as well. Just so that students are there, you know, being able to change with times, 
they were missing on their fun time in school of, uh, you know, not being able to ce uh, celebrate our Udu. So when Dr. Alice decided to have it online, we were a bit apprehensive, but then knowing him, you know, he was determined and we all kind of just uh, followed and we did it. And the kids really, really enjoyed themselves. So talking about, you know, the new skills, we have to be, we have to remember that uh, uh, the skills for tomorrow is not meant only for girls, only for boys. Uh, it's, it's meant for everybody. Education should be for everybody. Gone are the days where we said, the, you know, the man is the breadwinner of the family uh, because it's uh, the female or the lady who is uh, bringing the butter on the toast and the jam on the bread. So, you know, they also are working. The women also are working. They're working very hard. They work at home. They work in, outside at a job. So these are the skills that we need to teach even our boys, even little things of sewing, as uh, Mrs. Senalia said. We still, some of us have the old mentality where we think no, only girls should do this, only boys should do that. Once we start developing skills in our children to learn to do what has to be done, when it has to be done, uh, education will open you know we'll have more vistas and yes we keep we have to do a lot of the subjects that are required because that is what university wants so it's 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 like a you know cat and mouse game so we we know we know that uh, we are sometimes uh, you know adding on and adding on and adding on but at the same time we realize that this is what would take them a little bit ahead universities are requiring the top grades so, but when the universities come, they do tell us that, you know, they want wholesome students, all-rounded students. But when it comes to admission, it is still the A-stars that they want. It is still the A-stars that they are looking at. Of course, some universities are a bit more versatile and they're looking at more, more from the kids. And I do hope, I really do hope that with this uh, COVID-19, that we don't like, go back to doing the same things that we were doing before. Because uh, I think this is an eye-opener. I definitely think this is an eye-opener. And as we all say, 2020 is clear vision, right? And in this year, 2020, I think we have all begun to see things much more clearer. The air is much more clear. You're able to breathe without pollution. You look at the water. In fact, in Mumbai, they said that the sea had dolphins in it. And uh, we can see people more clear, clearer for what they are because this is a time of high stress and uh, you know, tension. And we see ourselves for what we are. How many of us have done something different in this past 60, 70 days that we are at home? Are we able to do something different or are we just sitting and moaning and mopping? You know, complaining the situation. This is there to stay, definitely. And it is, I think it's our own attitudes where we need to build and that is education. That is education feeling. It's not just the, the feeling of pain. It is about lighting that fire and that igniting that fire is something that we as educators also can help promote, help our kids to, you know, come up there because they are going out into a world which was very different. In fact, I'm most, I feel most sorry for my outgoing year 13 batch uh, because they had planned, they had so many things planned, you know, their last day in school, their graduation and blah, blah, blah. And we, this is a fantastic batch that we have a lovely bunch of kids. And I do feel sorry for them because they, are, they just don't know where they are. They just don't know what's happening. And so we just have to, you know, help them, help them to think differently, help them to think creatively. And uh, we keep telling them, yes, things are not going to be different, but it's not going to be the end of the world. So if, if, we, can, if we can do things which will, you know, help them, and I keep insisting, in fact, that's one thing which I told them, the future does not, does not belong to the strongest, the biggest, or the most intelligent. The future belongs to those who can change, adapt, learn, and relearn. Thank you, Mr. Noy, for sharing that uh, interesting uh, perspective. Uh, Mr. Kumara Singh, uh, anything further that you could uh, bring into the discussion? But into this yeah. question? First of all, I'm very happy to say that I'm in the camp of Ms. Anitra and that I don't have to uh, worry too much about pressing that button, uh, unlike Reverend Mark. Uh, so I'm, I'm quite lucky in that. I mean, uh, Vichel is a school where we have been the first school in this country to adapt the Cambridge curriculum. So we uh, kind of like envisage that we need to be at the forefront of innovation and change. And I think the Cambridge curriculum, like what Ms. Anitra mentioned, is right up there. 
So we have less pressure compared to uh, schools who does not do maybe the Cambridge curriculum. But having said that, still for all in this country, there are plenty of gaps, uh, Chatushka. For example, uh, to keep things simple, you know, how many kids would know when they're going into a campus on how to change a tire to do some basic wiring at home hmm, uh, on social etiquettes, manners and so on. So I think there's a lot to be done uh, from, you know, uh, the perspective of uh, policymakers. I mean, not to uh, criticize or condemn anyone, but if the policymakers and the people who can make the call are from the uh, blackboard and chalk era, then we can't expect any change, can we? Hmm? So this is where I feel a lot of, you know, innovative, uh, out-of-the-box thinking, like what uh, Reverend Mark correctly mentioned. We need that to come into play quickly. And we can't afford to lag because other countries are coming to the forefront. I mean, in countries like Estonia and Latvia, you have 13, 14 year old children who are doing Android app development. Whereas, you know, in our country, you have a situation where in certain textbooks, they are mentioned, this is a three and a half floppy disk. So I think uh, not to criticize anyone, but I think we are lagging uh, very much behind. Uh, how many of our educators would be familiar with the concepts of AI, machine learning, big data? Hardly any, but that's the change out there. We are still for all in a traditional framework where certain teachers are telling, put a you know, daughter become doctor, engineer, lawyer, architect, and so on. Traditional framework. Okay? None of these jobs will be there by 2030, Chatushka. In fact, even if you take a simple thing like even marketing, how many of the traditional marketers will survive in the next two years? It's all about digital marketing, social media marketing. You know, gone are the days when you know you develop a very good newspaper ad and you will succeed in the marketing field. That will no longer happen. So we really, really have to bring in the changes quickly. And I really hope, like what uh, Reverend Mark mentioned, if there's a task force and you know they are doing all these changes, they'll bring about these changes quickly. Because, like I told. Chatushka, you know, it's a very competitive world. The world is moving on and we need to change. But uh, like a couple of our speakers mentioned, you know, there are lapses from our end. Huh? How many report cards would capture the emotional intelligence of a child? Now, I think if there's a human being who has a very good awareness of his or her emotions and that of the other party, that's actually a very high competence that a human being is having as a leader or as a team player. But the report card will not capture it. We are in a country where if a child says, you know, mom, dad, I would like to become a very innovative chef. Okay, it's almost like taboo if you say like that. You no, know, they would tell what a crime. You know, our family have been having leading lawyers right throughout generations. How dare you, you know, uh, want to become a chef? So I think if we can get all these changes done quickly, we will have a future. Otherwise, it will be dark. It's uh, simple as that. Thank you. Absolutely. A very uh, valid perspective that you shared. Uh, education itself is a very dynamic industry that we are in, and we need to look into uh, a more agile and adaptive approach. Uh, Ms. Iflal, I, if I could uh, quickly uh, take your uh, views as well. Yes, um, I think uh, as uh, Hijaz, uh, we, at Hijaz, we have the local and the Cambridge cur curriculum. And like Anitra said, we can see a huge difference between the two um, curriculums because in the local curriculum, like Father Mark Milimoria was uh, mentioning, the volume of uh, subjects and the work is huge and it's uh, sometimes very impractical, especially when it comes to uh, teachers having to uh, complete syllabuses. It's like how a jug would just keep on uh, trying to fill up all the mugs and, you know, stack as much as possible into that and uh, push it in as much as possible. So when we do that, we stifle a lot of creativity in the children. We don't have actually time in the classroom to encourage creativity. It's absurd when you look at the content of the syllabus. So, um, when I was, uh, I, I spent a few years in uh, Scotland and I visited my uh, children's school on a voluntary basis. I, I uh, stayed in their classrooms just to study their system. So something that I really observed was that there was a lot of creativity and it's no wonder those countries have come so far and we are still lagging behind. So one of the things um, that uh, 
Now, when you look at the local grade six upwards syllabus, uh, the science syllabus, it has a lot of practical, uh, practical um, ways of doing it, but we don't have the time. So what we did was we um, uh, had an agreement with Igniter Space where we could bring out the um, STEM curriculum into the uh, syllabus to make mathematics and science interesting because those are the subjects that our children tend to hate and they tend to fail because at the end of the school career some most parents want their children to have the A stars and the A so that they could go into university and to all these uh, jobs like uh, doctor, engineer still most of the parents are not open to prospective uh, professions like uh, Mr. Kumar Singh said, a chef. Sometimes a chef would be making more money uh, and be having a more interesting life than a doctor. So we, we need to do something about the syllabus content. Cambridge is moving towards it. So we're happy to see that. But the local syllabus needs to also take it on take what other countries are doing and make it more happier for the children and for the teachers to teach. That's very important because creativity is very important in the next uh, 21st century skills. Thank you uh, very much, Ms. Sifla, for sharing your feedback. I have uh, a lot of other questions lined up, but in the best interest of time, I will also look into the audience questions that have been raised. Uh, so one question is, what confidence do parents need in order for students to seek for exams online? Does there need to be a level of scrutiny on testing validity? Should assessment strategies change? I would like to hear Ms. Pereira's comments on this first, if I may. Uh, actually, that's something which we also are now in looking at it because we don't know how we are going to continue in the future with this pandemic. So when it comes to scrutiny, I think it has, uh, I would say the best person to speak would be Vinita because they are, I think they were one of the first schools to conduct uh, exams online. So I don't want to take them the, uh, this thing. But I think uh, it, it is a shared role between the parents and the students where we entrust the parents to make sure there is proper, a proper exam environment in the house. Uh, there is proper scrutiny involved, there is no temptation to do uh, unethical things. Uh, so it's something that which uh, we will have to look into the future. Parents will need to cooperate with us, we will need to believe parents, uh, we will need to maybe have training for them, have a, like a session for them where we could uh, speak to them and ask them whether they have any concerns. So going into the future, this is something which all schools maybe first we need to have a discussion amongst our schools to see how we can uh, work this. Uh, because helping each other will make the best come out for the students. So that's why I think collaboration will come in with amongst all our schools. So it's something which we are working on at the moment. So I would say Gateway would be the best to answer this. Thank you, uh, Ms. Bear, for sharing your feedback. Uh, Reverend uh, Bilmuria, is there anything that you would add to this? No, I would uh, agree. Question? I would agree. We had only one. We have had only uh, very limited experience of online examinations. We had a mock exam for the Edexcel students uh, about two or three weeks ago, and that was our first experience. So I think I would, I will, I will give my time to all area. Thank you, uh, Ms. Uh, thank you, Reverend Billy Maria, for sharing that, uh, for sharing the feedback. Ms. Danita, uh, Ms. Chanoa, if I uh, direct the question towards you, if you could open up with your remarks. Well, yes, we, we did move into the mocks. As I told you, when the lockdown started on the 13th of May, we were to begin our mocks on the 18th. Um, so in a very short time, we decided, uh, our chairman was adamant that we go and do things as normal. Uh, keep things as normal as possible and we did move on to the mocks. So remember though the papers were uploaded online, the children did the answers and uploaded the answers online, teachers marked and whatever. But the fact was that the papers were set for a written paper. The question paper was set for a paper to be sat and written. So there was a bit of difference. And uh, 
probably if we had planned it differently, the style of paper would have been different where we would have been able to uh, verify how authentic as uh, how authentic the paper, how authentic the answers were. Uh, if I may say, if I may say something or, you know, give out a slight uh, very hilarious thing that happened, you know, we did realize that some of the answers where students did take the help of Auntie Google or Uncle Tuition Master. And in one case, one child had actually uploaded the tuition master's, uh, you know, notes. So, of course, that was that one incident, but many of the kids did it very well because you could make out from their style of answers. We were able to compare them. Uh, we did it because we wanted to do it. We wanted to do the mock exams. We wanted to see the, where the children sat. We also realized that if they do, did not have a public exam conducted by uh, Pearson's, we would have to have some kind of marks to give them uh, to be able to uh, verify their level of knowledge. But having said that, I would say that it was not, you know, 100% the best. But if over time we have to do um, uh, exams online, yes, it would be done in a different format. It would be done like how they do the SATs, where the, probably the questions are almost the same, but the way they rotate it, the children can't copy. At one time, we also gave students the opportunity to have an open book test, which means that they do the exam in a limited time, but they would have had to have knowledge. They needed to know where and where the answer was, because even if they sat to copy from the book, they would have written their first and second answer very well. The remaining answers would have been left behind because they would have been spending so much time searching. So even that open book uh, method is something which we can still do even now at the moment. Uh, setting papers to the style where students uh, will not uh, resort to malpractice is something which we will learn. Even when we did the mocks, as someone just mentioned, when we did the mocks, we had written to the parents and we requested them to uh, supervise the, their child's uh, doing the papers. Uh, parents were at home at that time, and that's why we requested the help of the parents to supervise, and the parents had to sign the answer script and the vigilance under their supervision. So it was done. That was from our side, from the school, we requested the help of the parents because they were there at home at that time. Authentic, that was also we do. So sometimes we need the help and support of the parents as well. The school can do just that much. You know, you need two hands to clap. Education is not one person's game. It's everyone involved in it. So looking at the future, yes, we can move on to online exams. Format will change and uh, we will also get, we have learned through the past experience and we will be able to do better papers when we have to do it next time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chenoin, for sharing your feedback. Uh, I would also uh, like to request the remaining panelists, if there is anything that you could add, uh, Ms. Uh, Sena Deva, Mr. Kumar Singh, Ms. Ifla, uh, on this particular question, or I will proceed uh, Just, to the next. Uh, uh, we, we, too, at Mises, we did have an online exam, which was actually prepared to be an online test. Uh, and uh, what we realized was that there was a lot of mistrust among the parents as well as outsiders, what will 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 they copy? Will the will the tuition master be uh, with them? And uh, you know that sort of uh, that sort of uh, mistrust uh, among the society. So I think we should change that attitude if we are going into go, going to go in for uh, online uh, exams in the late later. Because it, it, we might need it because uh, actually deciding it was even the teachers were scared to do it, but then we did it and it was quite uh, possible. There was only one case of plagiarizing. Uh, apart from that, we didn't have any other issue. But that attitude of mistrust should be taken out of uh, the, the society's minds, I think. Because uh, I think it's because of the, uh, the, 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 the negative competition, competitive mindset that we Sri Lankans have towards exams. Thank you, Mr. Aviran. 
Uh, Mr. Kumar Singh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Uh, trust is uh, the main thing when it comes to assessments. Uh, so it's very important that trust between the parents, the children and the school uh, is established before an assessment can be taken. So in my personal opinion, um, it is better to have an open book exam where the children are given the liberty to look at it. And like uh, Ms. Uh, Vinita said, they need to know, they need to have that knowledge to look where to look and to do it within that time limit. So, um, because when you look at the time frame, we've been closed, will be nearly three months since we closed school. So at one point we all have to do assessments because we can't just go on doing the classes. We need to assess the children. So personally, I feel an open book test would do at the moment with all our limited uh, resources. Thank you, Ms. Sifla. Mr. Kumar Singh, is there anything that you... Yeah, in, a, in a minute, just two terms comes to my mind. You know, uh, the term of integrity and plagiarism. So I think uh, if the entire population is, you know, having 100% integrity, this will not be a challenge. But that wouldn't be the case. I mean, we can't expect that to happen. Given the current situation, I think just like what Ms. Vinita mentioned, uh, it will... You know, the safest thing would be to have an open book test. That's a more pragmatic approach right now. But of course, I think like what Ms. Anitra mentioned, we need, we can focus on coming up with a, a proper mechanism, maybe in the future. I'm sure all of us can pool in our knowledge and come up with a mechanism where we can have proper testing in the future. But right now, I think it's safe to, you know, stick to open book test. That would be my stake on the matter. Thank you, Mr. Kumar Singh. Uh, we've also had uh, a few questions coming up from our viewers on online. Uh, so one question is: uh, Are there are there plans to revise or provide a concession for the school fees during the distant learning system? So that is a question that has come up uh, from our audience streaming in from Facebook. I would like to uh, I would like to get the views from Ms. Pereira first. Uh, I think this is a common question a lot of parents have raised on Facebook I've seen through various various groups. Uh, I know a lot of schools have given a concession. I mean at Aditya we have given a concession but also it's not a concession which you can give 50% off or something like that. But we have given a concession uh, taking into account because we are not using some of the facilities. But also it's not a thing that we could waive off the fees currently because we also are private school. We are not getting any financial aid from the government. We need to pay our teachers. We need to pay our utility bills. And we need to, some of us are on, uh, have taken loans for development of the school. So, but taking into account the current crisis, we, I mean, at Aditya and I know a lot of schools have given a concession for school fees. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Pera. Uh, Reverend Billy Moria, is there anything that you could share on this? Uh, well, we are, in a situation of being a school that is a non-profit organization and uh, basically uh, what one hand gets the other hand gives we don't have reserves we don't have savings we don't have uh, huge uh, uh, you know free funds to fall back on and uh, a huge staff that we have to sustain you know i can't tell my staff i can't pay you salaries simply because i'm not i'm not able to get fees so as Anitra said, we've, we've all got commitments that have to be fulfilled, uh, just like everybody else in this country. So we, we continue with our fee collection. And I must say the, the majority of the parents have been very, very supportive. And they have been paying fees uh, consistently even during this time. Uh, but we have mechanisms in place for fee support and for bursarial support for people who uh, require that support on a, on a need-based uh, evaluation. Uh, and of course, no child will be penalized. That's something that we have never done. Even a child who is unable to pay fees under normal circumstances, we, we find ways once we've ascertained the genuine nature of such a situation to support the child and to carry the child through school. Uh, we've never had to close our doors to a child simply because of non-payment of fees, and we will continue to do that. But of course, we need to ascertain the genuineness of the, of the, of the concern, and we have a team in place to do that a bursarial department that is looking into that. Uh, and our old boys and, and parents have come forward in a very, very generous way to 
support uh, students who may find it difficult to to cover their fees at the moment uh, and there is a process for that to take place so while we have not been able to give a concession on the fees i must say that we have mechanisms in place to support children who are uh, in need of of support and no child will be turned away from the school for the lack of not paying thanks for the response uh, ms sinadira is there anything that you could uh, yeah. add to we do like a cc we are also a not for profit school uh, well our parents have been very supportive they have paid most of them have paid their fees we have had so far i have had not uh, no complaints about from the parents about uh, any fee issue because probably they know by uh, we, we uh, they know what they pay for a term and if they divide that by the by the number of months for the the, the term i mean divide by four they know how little they pay towards the school fees uh, so i don't think uh, our parents have had any issue like that because uh, like at uh, st thomas's we too uh, don't have uh, any because because we are not for profit we just can't afford to produce fees thank you mr nadira mr shanoy if uh, we could hear your perspective as well uh yes as uh, we are a school which is uh, being fund which is does not get funded by the government we fund our own uh, you know establishment by the fees that are being paid by the student uh but yes having said that uh, students who are having problems uh, parents who are having problems they have written to the school and we have made uh we have made adjustments for those particular students we have as the of our student uh, you know suffer because of having an issue uh, we have personally the chairman dr alis and myself have spoken to parents called parents one after the other had a chat with them and they were parents genuine parents and they were supportive uh, besides that uh, you know the school has also supported in the form of giving free microsoft uh, Uh, accounts to all the students from grade three upwards. Uh, we have uh, provided them with data uh, uh, and uh, you know uh, connections with the part being paid by the school. They have also been given the offer of uh, buying uh, devices, laptops, which uh, substantial amount has been uh, taken care of by the school. So the school giving its uh, is trying to give its best. And having said that, I must say, in this past sixty seventy days. the teachers have not had a single day break except the one our do to day uh, they have been working continually we have had the virtual uh, vesa virtual avrudu teachers have been preparing that's not something that they have done before but they still want to see that the students are getting the best which means that the teachers also are working they have not been uh, sitting idle doing nothing so they have been providing a full service to the maximum of the best and most let me tell you most parents have been extremely appreciative and if at all there's a problem they have come and said that you know this is the problem we are having a problem with device both our children in the same section and that's how we also uh, made it uh, had our classes in such a way that we broke it up into different sessions so that children we were accommodating them so all in all i must say that parents who have chosen gateway college know the culture of the school know the values you know placed by mr rt alis where it is you know like a family situation and therefore most parents have been very very supportive uh, and uh, accommodative and have been able to pay the fees and of course as i said if there were problems if they have written to the school called us we have taken care of them thank you uh, mr shanoy uh, mr kumar singha if you would like to add that question pretty much like what ms vinita mentioned it's the same at vichali i mean uh, majority of the parents uh, understood the fact that you know teachers are doing the hard work they are putting in the hard yards and i would say there were teachers who went out of the way during this period chatushka i mean they had to innovate they had to do a lot of work it's not like being in a physical classroom they had to make videos animations you know uh, for a child who couldn't uh, come in the morning session maybe do a call in the evening people went out of the way i'm telling you from principals to you know even the office workers everyone should be appreciated here everyone worked very hard so given that situation it would be unfair for people to ask 
for a reduction in fees but we have been very humane like what reverend mark mentioned we have given adequate time sometimes you know for example chatushkar uh, the second term fees we gave time till last week to pay that is the amounts which were due on due in january we allowed them to pay up till now or and even when some parents told they can pay in a few installments we've been very flexible because we do realize you have the odd parent working in italy or south korea who has suddenly lost employment and the employers haven't paid them in the last three months so it's not that we have been heartless or we've been very humane very understanding and like what miss vinita mentioned i think 90% of the parents have understood the delivery of the teachers of this country and that they've done a tremendous job the balance portion to chatushka no parent in their right mind and heart would like to refrain from paying they want to genuinely pay but these people lost jobs during covid and they're struggling if you are a retail shop owner uh, you know if you were into garments you know you lost business so we have been very human we have been accommodative but of course we to have our overheads teachers have their own personal bank loans their utilities to pay and they're working hard sometimes even going beyond their data quota and i i'm, I'm very proud to say chatushka i haven't had a single teacher who came forward and told me sir i don't have data i can't do this and that everyone pulled up their socks and did their level best so i think in that way as a nation we can be very proud of our uh, teacher community so that's my take on it so we will continue to help parents in whatever way we can but of course we it cannot be free of charge thank you mr parvati just Parvati. add one sentence to that i just one sentence sure. to what manish just said uh, as we are really really thankful to our doctors and nurses who have been doing a great job for the country and to the armed forces i think it's time that we appreciated our teachers because they are the unsung heroes they are the unsung heroes and they are the ones who are working many hours seven days a week with their own families in spite of their own families because they know that they are taking care of the future generations so i think our, our teachers deserve a huge round of applause and they are the unsung heroes i think we should more certainly give that clap all of us because we are the educators here so i think we should may i just add also to that Uh, we have talked about teachers but we must also remember those who help us with our sports uh at st thomas's at least 23 of our 26 sports the coaches have online coaching going on through the through the platforms that we offer because they also are part of our family of of resource persons and many of them uh have have uh, been very faithful to the school we've continued to pay them as well so uh, i mean uh, anybody with a, with a bit of common sense will understand that to pay we need to have a, have money coming in and so we have to charge our fees without without a break but yes, yes, i endorse i endorse vinita's view i just want to add to that uh, i mean that's the main thing but uh, i think parents also know what we deliver would not ask us for reduction but because of the current crisis yes some schools are given but at alita we have also spoken to some of the banks uh, arranged loans arranged credit cards to pay in 0% installments so i'm happy to say that the banking community have come in to schools to help us so th- those are ways that we could do but it's only fair for us to charge the fees to give because there are the unsung heroes like the teachers the coaches and all and they also have their own commitments and they also have their families to run so then parents understand and when you explain to them the point they do understand but it is that at that right moment when they have lost their jobs some have got more than 50% salary cuts they tend to turn to the schools for reduction so but when you do explain to them parents do understand and they are very cooperative so that's what i think thank you for all the perspectives shared absolutely uh, very valid perspective shared by our esteemed panelists uh, miss iflal uh, um, if i could get your perspective as well uh, quickly i think i'm witness to father mark billimoria's uh, statement about the coaches because i had my son waking up at 6 o'clock every day doing his exercises because they come on zoom and they uh, conduct exercises every every single day it's it's done so 
it's a real um, it's nice to watch our children being active even though they're not going to school uh, with regard to fees uh, in our school we uh, we did give uh, um, we, we passed a google form around and asked parents who have difficulty genuine difficulty to apply uh, for concessions but it's uh, like if, if i think everybody would agree it's difficult to give a waiver uh, because we need to run the school school maintenance is going on uh, utility bills have to be paid maybe not uh, the the amount maybe not as great as uh, when school functions but still we have our bills we have our teachers and uh, as a school and uh, as parents we all need to appreciate the work done by the teachers because Uh, some teachers have uh, woken up at four o'clock in the morning because we, they needed to reserve the data for their children's classes. So what they did was they woke up at four in the morning to prepare the lessons because they needed to download uh, a whole lot of uh, stuff, and uh, that needed a lot of data. So they were using the off-peak data as much as possible to prepare. Because uh, when I just asked for a ten-minute presentation. they needed to sit in front of the computer for at least about 2 hours so this is a totally different situation where you can't don't come to class and write on the board and you know it needs to be more interesting and it needs to be more innovative and teachers were going overboard everywhere in the world trying to make the lessons as lively and as interesting as possible especially because the children are stuck at home they can't go out and they can't play with their friends they don't have they don't have that opportunity to put their energy out so they needed to be uh, kept interested in the lesson so teachers were going really out of the way so schools have to pay the full salary to the parent the, the, to the teachers so we need the 100% salary that the te- uh, fees for us to pay 100% salary so but uh, we know the difficulty that parents have had so we've given we've looked at it case by case and we've given uh, different solutions to different people thank you ms uh, ifla for sharing that feedback uh, moving on to another question uh, if and when the schools are reopen uh, i mean schools were pretty much the first to sh- first to shut down uh, during the phase of lockdown and it's quite evident that schools will most likely be the last to open as well but in the event when schools reopen what are some of the strategies you expect to put in place to protect school children and teachers will you be opening do you have plans in opening the school in different phases where uh, there would be um, disinfection and disinfection and then you probably would get in the academic faculty uh, moving ahead with uh, prioritizing students of ordinary level and advanced level examinations and last week school open up the school uh, for the rest do you have uh, a plan as such and also what is the infrastructure investment that you would undertake in terms of thermometers in terms of hand washing sinks in terms of medical beds uh, what is uh, the school's point of view on this I would like to first ask uh, Ms. Pereira. So this is where actually it's going to be a heavy cost for schools uh, because there's a lot of infrastructure uh, uh, expenses that we are going to face. Uh, according to the uh, survey that was put out, uh, the timetable that was put out by the government, schools are due to open on the 8th or the 15th. Uh, practically, I don't think that will happen because schools will be the, should be the last to open because kids. knowing kids who have been at home lockdown for so long when they coming to school they are going to forget in everything about social distancing uh especially primary kids you can't tell them to please don't keep your one meter away uh don't hug don't share the pencil that's not going to happen in school so i would say first would be to we are getting academic staff uh, staff to come in uh work with them then we start with the higher classes because they will be more able to understand also we could look at uh, options like we do a morning shift for one particular grade a few couple of grades and then an afternoon shift but this all has to be given through the uh, moe and the government because we need them to get tell us because i mean for a school like us we could do something but there are much bigger schools even on this panel uh, like even mark st thomas Uh, mutes they are huge numbers so a permanent solution needs to be given to us as educators on how we're going to open 
but uh, i think in my perspective schools should be the last to open on the list uh, till then we should go on with online education because we have seen in the world schools opening and closing within the next day i mean in south korea they open and again they shut france they open again they shut so we don't we as a nation can't afford to do that because uh, we we should not go to that stage so my perspective is we need a strong set of guidelines yes we need to have the thermometers yes we need to have the disinfectant chambers we need to disinfect the entire school daily uh, even when it comes to washrooms every time a child goes we we have to be disinfected so those are a lot of practical and logistic issues we are going to face as the as heads in school so but still the government needs to give us all this in black and white so because parents even though we start school parents are not going to send their kids we are not going to have 100% attendance at the start it's going to be like last year it's going to start at a very small percentage and then only slightly going up and up and maybe in a couple of months we'll have to run actually the school and actually to run online at the same time because they are not going to get like a 100% attendance so we await the government to give us and i know the the task force is working very hard on this and hopefully in the next couple of weeks we should get some sort of answer thank you uh, reverend milimuria if i could get your yeah, thank you well. um, I, i if i can just mention to or share with the other members of the panel there is actually a circular that was issued by the ministry of education on the 11th of may uh, which is a 30 page document on the guidelines for reopening school uh, and i think that's an extremely comprehensive a uh, document that uh, that in fact st thomas's has used to take its own plan for reopening based on that document uh, put out by the ministry so what our plan is uh, to follow a, a phased gradual uh, return to school the teachers will come in first for a period of training on how to deal with the situation when the children come back the children will come back from the most senior uh, classes first and i personally feel that the the youngest students may not really be coming back to school this term and we are maybe looking at a scenario of uh, bringing them back to what's the third term when things are a little bit more settled in the school in terms of health and safety we are in, we've installed and are continuing to install the necessary infrastructure in terms of the the sanitizers in the classrooms the sinks to wash hands and stuff at the entrances the apparatus for checking temperature whatever whatever everybody else is doing is happening and uh, that that's going to be there but once we come back we are also looking at um, really going into a blended learning scenario where there will be a uh, physical classroom attendance part of the week but also online at online classes part of the week for the same classes so that five days a week the, the boys would not need to be in class we would spread out the the online and the physical presence so that there is less um, crowd in the school in that sense so blended learning a, a mixture of the traditional face to face physical learning with online learning will happen uh, we are also looking at a six day working week at at the start uh, so we would be looking at uh, perhaps even on a saturday uh, looking at online classes uh, and and our teachers have uh, have come on board for that so that we will keep you know things going as as much as possible uh, and then hopefully in the third term we can return to bringing more students back into the school but our priority over the next few weeks would be the a level students uh, and of course our o level students who face exams in december thank you uh, mr senadir if i could uh, yes hear your uh, perspective as well yeah we have already started the implementing the the uh, guidelines that have been given by the government and uh, yeah, i saw a question coming up here can you find it it is available and i mean i saw a, a, a question in the chat and i'll answer that question as well uh, uh, where the, where can we find the document it is available on the uh, ministry of education website uh, if you go and uh, and we we have already started and uh, yes uh, we have all, we are actually in par with the curriculum we we have not missed out anything we are not uh, so we can uh, catch up here there is not much for us to do uh, uh, we, are, we are already uh, doing the second year terms work and 
uh, the, the, the putting things in place have started in the school, so I don't think we will have a problem. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Senorita. Ms. Shanoi, if we could hear your com comments as well. Uh, we would definitely go with what the government uh, instructs us to do. We'll have to go back to day two. Uh, unlike the last year's April bombing, where we were one of the first schools to reopen, uh, because we had our own teachers in place, you know, manning the gates, securing, checking, and everything. But this is a totally different situation. And uh, when it comes to health and hygiene, we are in the process of planning of how best we can uh, manage the situation. Uh, though I have heard everyone saying that it would be good for starting with the year, the bigger classes. In my personal opinion, in my personal opinion, I think it's the little ones. Uh, I would have thought of bringing back to school because uh, online learning, of course, we when, when we reopen, probably we will have a hybrid learning or a brick and click learning where we'll have partial learning in both. This is much more easier when it comes to the bigger kids. But when it's with the smaller ones, the foundation and the year one and two, then in front of the screen for a long time, is one major problem. Secondly, parents are all going to work and the kids are going to be left alone at home. Uh, it's, a, it's a huge concern. It's a really huge concern. And there's only so much learning that can happen while the children are at home. So in my personal opinion, when I was just having a chat the other day, I was saying, I think it would be better for us to start off with the little ones. Yes, we would have to plan it in such a way that, you know, this, you know, distances is maintained. Maybe we'd have half classes on some days or whatever. We will be putting that in place so that we have uh, the best of both worlds. Thank you, Mr. Shanoi. Mr. Kumar Singer, if you could share your perspective as well. Um, pretty much, I believe even we too will follow whatever the guideline that the government and the medical officials will be issuing. Um, but my personal opinion would be, I mean, inevitably we'll have to follow that guideline. I would like to have a situation where, you know, there is a steady product out there in the market saying, here is the injection or the tablet that can cure COVID-19. And that could be my personal day when I feel I can give a personal green light as to when kids should come back. To be very blunt about it, Chatushka, I believe the, the real wealth of a nation happens to be its children. And even if one child gets compromised, even in my young and as an educator, I would have failed. I will, I will not be, you know, selfishly thinking in my school, I have put all the, you know, sanitizer, all the equipment, you know, to measure temperature, all these things. But as an educator, I would be heartbroken if I watch television and I see that one child died because of COVID-19 by us reopening. At the moment, I know things aren't perfect, but somehow we are, you know, delivering education without putting them in any danger. So I really hope end of the day, uh, the people who will be making the decisions will keep this particular point in mind because like what Ms. Anitra mentioned, we don't want a scenario where we open the schools and, you know, 48 hours later, we regret and we do post-mortem analysis, you know, dissecting the body and trying to give a verdict as to, you know, why we went wrong. That would be unwise. So my personal opinion is that I could be wrong, but that's my personal sentiment. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kumar Singh. Definitely a valid perspective that you share. Uh, Ms. Iflal, if we could hear your thoughts as well, please. I think I uh, agree with Mr. Kumar Singh 100% because uh, we need to flatten the curve and stamp it down before we could bring our children back into school because they're definitely going to come in and they're going to hug and they're going to share. And however much you tell them, they're not going to listen. Even if you put hand sanitizers, sink, uh, every two meters you put a sink and ask them to wash, still they're going to sneeze on each other's face and uh, they're going to share food Then you know, it's going to be very difficult. So I don't uh, see schools reopening till August. Uh, but I think private schools and certain uh, other schools are quite okay because we're doing the online lessons and the children are being taught. But then we need to think about, we, we, there are about 10,000 schools in Sri Lanka. So most of the other schools in Sri Lanka, the children have been just left uh, for about 
now three months. Um, so maybe the government, for the government, it's the whole of the country. So they're trying to think about the education and the health. So I think the government has a huge responsibility to weigh it down and decide which one is more important. Uh, in, in our case, we are not so hard hit because we are still going on, our education is happening and the children are learning uh, and we could continue till about August. And um, also there will be issues like Ms. Vinita said, uh, where parents will have to go to work and children will be left alone. They will not have people to look after because uh, sometimes parents depend on schools to take care of their children during the time they're, they're away. So there are a whole lot of other social issues also, but the government has a huge responsibility before they open schools. And I think it will be best for us to flatten the curve uh, completely before we do start. Uh, Chatushka, may I just add something, if you don't mind? I think sure. we also have to remember that even though we may have the intention of opening schools or the government may want to open schools, an important factor is the parent. And judging from last year's reaction of the parents, despite all the assurances given by the schools about safety, it took a long time for all the children to come back because parents have natural fears and apprehensions. Uh, those who use public transport, for example, or van services will certainly think twice before uh, sending their children. Uh, to school because uh, you know the, that, that's that's public and we have seen uh, how the how the buses are these days. Uh, even school vans that are chocker blocked like sardine cans, you know. Uh, perhaps for children attending schools like ours, where they come in private vehicles, uh, not all of them do, but quite a lot of them do. It won't be such a big deal. But parents will have the fear, and I think the final call on this should be left to the parent. So just like last year, we, we didn't penalize children for not coming to school after we reopened. This year also, we don't intend to penalize any child for not coming to school because that's actually something we have to keep in mind. Parents have a, have a right to make that decision. Uh, indeed, a uh, very valuable, uh, valuable perspective. And thank you for sharing your sentiments, uh, Reverend uh, Billy Moria. Uh, so, uh, I mean, in the best interest of time, uh, my final question to the panelists is, do you believe in a bright, prospective for Sri Lankan education? Any final advice or suggestions on what should be implemented in the future from your perspective? I would also request if the panelists could keep it for two minutes uh, for answering this question. Uh, starting with Ms. Pereira. Atushka, I think uh, the main thing, what I would say as our topic is redefining classrooms. That's the first thing we as educators need to put together because uh, Sri Lankan education, we do have all the potential. It's just that we need to harness it in the correct way. So going forward uh, with this, uh, I must say, there is some uh, good out of this pandemic. We are all changing. Teachers are adapting. I have seen my staff who are very, uh, I mean, a few of elderly staff who are experienced teachers for 40 years of uh, this thing now doing online classes and all. And to, for me, it's really happy to see that they're actually keeping up with the younger teachers. So going forward, uh, Sri Lankan education, if I think this pandemic might, uh, there is hope for changing uh, the government syllabus. Uh, the, I'm glad that the special task force is looking into newer things. Uh, maybe, we can come out of this and there is some betterment for this thing and we as educators we can all work together and support each other uh, of how we can best forward give our best to the kids and like uh, reverend mark said uh final decision of the should be left to the parents and we as educators must support their decision must not penalize them uh, but also continue blended learning in the future so I would say this is going to be a very hybrid system which we are going to adapt. Our teachers need to adapt, our kids need to adapt, and also our parents. And uh, going forth, it should be a revolutionized uh, education platform we are all going to use. So it may be not 21st century, maybe we need to find a new term called uh, what we are all facing. So that would be my concluding remarks. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Reverend uh, Mumuria, if we could hear your uh, well. For me, I think the whole purpose of education needs to be uh, rethought out. 
uh, we have been far too uh, caught up in this whole exam oriented education system uh, we have forgotten to you know focus more on developing holistic all round you know young men and women of character you know our country badly needs people like that uh, we don't need too many phd's we don't need too many uh, people who go off to university and come back with an inflated self of them, you know sense of themselves we need good human beings responsible citizens those who will contribute to this country and not contribute to the brain drain that takes place when they go off to australia new zealand uk us for studies right our education system must focus on ch putting out children who will contribute to our welfare in this country because there's far too much of a brain drain taking place and far too much of of people thinking that you know uh, especially our schools are part of a family of schools perhaps where people assume that the the end result of our education system is a child who will go out there and you know make the most money uh, who will who will be able to succeed what is success we need to teach what success is uh we have to contribute positively to society we have to put out young men and women of character who will add something worthwhile to our society and not just be part of this 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 you know this production line uh of 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 uh, the the world that is around us at the moment uh we need people going into the public sector we need people going into the administrative sector in this country into those areas that uh, we think are, are not good for people from our schools to go to uh, so for me education has to look at a change of entire lifestyle of a child uh, so that it's not just up here it also affects this and the way you think and the way you view the world otherwise our education has failed a phd is not as important as how you deal with other human beings in society so thank you very much for this opportunity and to have shared with all of you great uh, concluding remarks uh, and statements uh, shared uh, again by reverend uh, pilmoria uh, miss uh, senadira what would be your final comments yeah. uh, i know it's uh, respecting your request to keep it short <laughs> i would use one sentence i think uh, i think we need to understand the new norm and adopt it that's that's what we need to do i think that uh, that's that's my view and that's my last and thank you again yes uh, again that statement itself speaks uh, volumes so thank you miss uh, senadira miss shanoy i will repeat the statement that i said a bit earlier that education is not filling a pail but igniting a fire and exactly what uh, uh, father mark said It's making the children wholesome kids, making them good individuals, building their values, building their character, is something which is so very, very, very important. Uh, I must say that I would very, very proudly talk about Sri Lankans. I love Sri Lankans, and I think Sri Lankans have fantastic resilience. No matter what comes, no matter what bulldozes them, they stand up again. I have seen. I can talk about my school, which is like a family. with our founder mr rit alas who created this unity among everybody and that's carried on by our chairman dr harsh alas when i see my group of teachers and the group of students who come from different communities they come from different backgrounds but when we when we get together when there's a problem each one tries to support it i can just tell you at this moment with this pandemic and how the learning has happened no matter how many hours of training but it was the collaboration between the teachers helping each other supporting each other and let me tell you it was not age that kept people back from doing uh, work and working online it was an attitude and uh, as i would as i would like to say again it was my it's the team where i had which was very strong and this team which i have in school is basically a reflection of the uh, sri lanka society i would very happily say and i would very proudly say that sri lankans are great people they have great resilience and nothing is going to put you down and let me tell you this too will pass and in a matter of time i think sri lanka will be shining up again and will be one of the best countries in the world and uh, i think that because even they has shown by the number of uh, 
the victim, the number of patients who have died, which is very minimum. I think uh, in a matter of time, tourists will be flooding back to Sri Lanka. And uh, I would like to see a lovely, I'm trying to paint a rosy picture and I think all of you will add color to that. So thank you very much, honored to be recalled uh, with such lovely people. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Noy, for sharing uh, your honest, uh, honest, uh, honest feedback. Uh, Mr. Kumara Singh, your final comments? Yes, uh, I think uh, looking at the way things are going in the world, Chatushka, in my opinion, data will be the number one factor. Uh, whoever has data will be running the show in the world. So it will be a situation where you need to train children on how to acquire data and manage the data. Um, so it's very important that while we uh, move into this new age of data, we instill good values in them. You wouldn't want to have a doctor who has the knowledge there is a tumor growing inside the finger. He will have that data and the knowledge. But if he is going to use that data in an unethical way, where they allow the wound to fester, and where he can make a lot more money using that knowledge, it would be then wrong. So we need to create an education system where they have the know-how, they have the data, but use it in a good way. So it's, it's very important that we develop education system where we are training our children to run uh, the country, the economy, society based on data, but with good governance. So I think that's going to be a key for the future. Uh, just to add to what Ms. Vinita mentioned, I think Sri Lankans are amazing people. We've gone through a lot. We've gone through, I mean, uh, from the colonial rule uh, to a 30-year-old war, to tsunami, to JVP crisis, now uh, a global pandemic. But here we are, all of us here today, smiling and you know sharing our knowledge and somehow hmm, looking at a brighter future. I think that's where Sri Lankans are amazing people. I think uh, we saw this video uh, done by a foreign gent uh, where they showed how a tourist in L was being treated by our people. I mean, that, that was fantastic, you know, a gesture from our end. So I think there's a lot of good in our people. Uh, let's hope that we will uh, develop children who can use data, but for the good. I think if we come up with a blended learning uh, system in the country in the next uh, for, you know, say one year or two year period with that kind of arrangement, uh, Sri Lanka has a good chance of doing well at a global level in every dimension. And uh, once again, I would like to thank you, Chatushka and Michelle and all my fellow panelists. Uh, it was uh, indeed a privilege and honor to be with you all this evening. And I really enjoyed uh, sharing uh, the viewpoints with you all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kumar Singh, for sharing a, a patriotic perspective. Uh, and I would like to request uh, Ms. Iflal for her closing remarks as well. Um, change has happened with this pandemic, but we need to continue the change. We can't stop as uh, when things get back to normal, say. So we need to make sure change is continuing to uh, go on. And uh, one of the changes that I would prefer to see as a school head is to see changes in the learning environment. And like Mr. Kumara Singer said, ethics education, moral education needs to be taken up in a big way in our school. It's not about religious education, it's about ethics and morals. Because sometimes religions can divide us, but morals and ethics will unite us. So we want children who are not only knowledgeable, but will be ethically inclined towards using their knowledge, like how he told about a doctor. Um, being ethical or unethical. And also another thing that I would like to see in change, a change is that we need to stop being obsessed with results. Uh, because um, even in when the results came, 2019, O-level results came, there was a girl who committed suicide just because she didn't get nine A's. She had, I think she had got eight A's. And I was shocked uh, that a child, that shows the amount of pressure that she had got from her home and the school. So we need to stop pressurizing our children. We need to stop uh, being obsessed with uh, results as schools and parents. And we need to change the learning environment for the betterment of our country. 
and the future generation. And thank you, Chatushka and Michelle for inviting me. And I'm honored to be amongst an esteemed panel like uh, your. Thank you very much. Uh, Chatushka, may I just add one final line? Uh, those days, they, I mean, till recent, they used to say that the countries that had oil were the richest. But I think going forward, it's the countries that have big data would be the ones who would be controlling the game. So I think Sri Lanka has the potential to do that. And that is through education. So, I mean, we as educators can all get together and move into the future. And uh, I would like to also thank Michelle uh, Chatushka and the esteemed panel. And I'm glad to be a part of this panel to see forward thinking. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Ms. Iflal, as well as uh, Ms. Pereira for sharing strong uh, concluding statements. So that uh, brings our two and a half hour long webinar to a close. Uh, I am extremely thankful to the panelists for taking time off their busy schedules, allocating time uh, for this in informative and insightful webinar. On behalf of Chocola, I would like to uh, I would like to wish you and your education institute all the very best in uh, the initiatives that you foresee to undertake. Uh, have a great rest of the evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 What I would say about UCL is that all partners care about the academic experience and that is very, very strong at UCL. Because the struggle is real. Because the hustle keeps you up. Because the passion keeps you going. With the partnership between Monash College and UCL, now a premier education isn't just a pipe dream. You can now choose what you want to study and where you want to be in life. Call us now.